So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published, all at the same time. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon We should have a specific goals um, do research and Make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making 
itong bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP-P.PIDS.gov.PA. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have specific goals, um, do research, and 
make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila Siyar, your moderator. Our topic this afternoon is very timely. As we all know, just yesterday, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck northern Philippines and caused structural damage, triggered landslides, and killed and injured a number of people. The impact was felt in nearby provinces and even here in Metro Manila. 
discussing about disaster risk reduction and management or DRRM and making sure our local governments are ready to respond and our communities are well prepared are very important given the Philippines' vulnerability to natural hazards. It is worth asking whether our local governments are investing and, and spending enough on the RRM and whether community participation is practiced in developing the RRM plans and programs. To start our conversation and give, and give us uh, more information about today's topic, may I call on our president, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta Jr. Sir? Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon. Allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following to uh, choose to be with us today. Uh, from the government, uh, we have Department of Transportation Under Secretary Kim Robert De Leon, also Representatives Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director Dina Basagi, Public uh, Private Partnership Center Deputy Executive Director Ilesar Ricote, Office of Civil Defense Director Texon Jan Lim, National Anti Poverty Commission Victims of Disasters Calamities President uh, Med Villanueva. Local uh, Municipal City Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Officers Nationwide. From the private sector, we have uh, Maximilian and, and Company Advisors Incorporated Chief Operating Officer Maria Teresa Magisa. Uh, Philippine Export Risk Confederation Incorporated Vice President Maria Rodelisa Leong and Astrata Director Maria Chris Sia Al Alonte. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following. We have the University of Visayas Executive Director, Victorina Sousa, Committee State University Director, Susan Tan, Central Bicol University of Agriculture Director, Emerson Ber Bergonio, Ateneo de Naga University Center for Community Development Director, Emil Santo Domingo, Mindanao State University Main Campus Director, Padao Bula. From CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have Barcelona Heritage and Development Council CEO Henry Estipona, Presidents of Bike Scouts, Life Haven Center for Independent Living, Samahan ng uh, Responsabling Anak ng Nayon Incorporated, Barangay People's Council, Mabulo, and Nanaga City Federations of PWDs, Directors and Executive Directors of Lormac uh, Community Development Foundation Incorporated, meticulously justified delivering service to humanity incorporated government watch philippine center for islam and democracy naga city people's council and naga city urban poor federation we also greet our friends from the media finally we also greet our uh, guests uh, colleagues from government academic civil society uh, media private sector and those watching through the pids and Serpi Facebook pages. As we continue to recover from the severe uh, socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, the threat of natural hazard lingers in our midst. The country's ranking with the Global uh, Climate Risk Index in 2021 speaks of critical risks we are exposed to and the COVID-19 pandemic and the new contagious disease, diseases that may threaten public health. The Climate Risk Index or CRI which is based on the impact of extreme weather events associated with uh, socioeconomic data indicates that the country's exposure and vulnerability to extreme events. The Philippines ranks 17th in the world among the countries most affected by extreme weather events. However, if we are to consider the long-term climate risk index, which is the result of the annual averages from, 20, uh, from 2000 to 2019, and include fatalities and uh, economic losses plus the number of uh, climate events, we rank fourth in the world, next to Puerto Rico, Myanmar, and Haiti in this order. In the last 10 years, we have witnessed several destructive typhoons, including Typhoon Pablo in 2012, Yolanda in 2013, Hong Kong in 2018, and Ulysses in 2020, all of which wreaked unprecedented havoc on human lives and livelihood. In line with the National Disaster Resilience Month observance in this, this July, uh, it's time to take a step back and reflect on how well we as a nation work to address the threat of national hazards 
by revisiting the implementation of the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act of 2010. This law provides a comprehensive, full hazard, multi-sectoral, interagency, and community-based approach to disaster risk reduction management. The DRRM law, as it is known, recognizes the critical role of local governments uh, as frontliners and first responders in every disaster event and as the lead, main lead in preparing for responding to and recovering from the effects of any disaster. To enable agencies to perform their, their, their functions, laws stipulates that they should set aside 5% of their budget as a local calamity fund. In 2012, the government introduced a new policy authorizing LGUs to use up to 70% of these funds for pre-disaster preparedness and risk reduction measures. The remaining 30% is reserved as a quick response fund, which LGUs can only tap uh, for relief and response if the locality is declared under a state of calamity. However, in a study assessing the DRM, which we will hear in full length this afternoon, the authors, Dr. Sani Domingo and Ms. R.B. Joy Manihan, found that despite the fiscal resources available to our LGUs, most of them underinvest in DRM. DRM. Dr. Domingo and Ms. Manihar uh, attributed this in part to the oversight agencies and clear directives and local administrative spending preferences. Moreover, they found that the approaches promoting stakeholder participation in DRM planning and implementations are limited. These two key issues comprom compri compromise the DRM loss potential for developing resilient local communities to disaster and emergencies. I thank the authors of this study for taking time to present their highly relevant paper in this virtual forum. Aside from the presentation of Dr. Domingo and Ms. Manihar, we will also hear the response and insights of our invited experts. We have Mr. Benito Salvador, Acting Chief of the Office of Civil Defense DRRM Fund Management Division under the Rehabilitation and Recovery Management Service. In addition, we are honored to have with us Acting Deputy Executive Director Maria Pamela Quezon of the Department of Finance Bureau of Local Government Finance. Meanwhile, uh, to share with us the experience of this municipality in the RRM is Vice Mayor Limuel Traya of the Municipality of Aboyo in the province of Leyte. We are deeply honored to have all of you in this webinar. To our attendees, we appreciate your presence and continued participation in our webinar. Your active involvement encourages our researchers to do better and enables fruitful conversation uh, on important policies, issues that affect us all. I look forward to an engaging and full discussion this afternoon. And I'll give back the floor to the moderator. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta. Before I call on our uh, first uh, speaker, allow me to remind you of our guidelines to join uh, the discussion. So you may post your questions and comments using the Q&A button uh, in Zoom. I repeat, please use the Q&A button for your comments and questions. Please indicate your name and organization if you'd like to be identified when I read out the questions. To all the presenters and discussants, you may re respond by typing your answers, which will be visible to all attendees. Alternatively, you can choose to answer the question live during the open forum. For our live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. So please use the comment section on Facebook for your questions. We'll accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. Okay, so let us begin our conversation by listening to our presenters who will discuss their research. Um, Dr. Sani Domingo is a research fellow at PIDS. He has more than three decades of extensive multi-sector technical and policy research exposure in agricultural research and development and extension natural resource management, and disaster risk reduction and management. He is a member of the Council of Fellows of the Philippine Public Safety College. His current research interests include ecological integrity and environmental policy, technical agriculture and resource economics, and climate change and disaster risk management. 
On the other hand, uh, his co-author, Ms. R.B. Troy Manihar, is a research specialist at the IDS, and her research areas include the environment, waste management, extractive industries, and disaster risk reduction and management. Dr. Domingo and Ms. Manihar, the virtual floor is now yours. R.B., Annie, you yes. may go ahead. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila, for that introduction. Um, I will be sharing my screen for a while. Okay. Can everyone see it na po? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this study entitled Examining the Philippines' Public Investment and Bottom-Up Approach to Disaster Risk Reduction and Management. I am RV Manihar, and I will be um, tackling the first part of this study from rationality until some parts of the public investment. And then I will turn you over to Dr. Domingo for the rest of the results and key insights. So as a background, um, we, must, um, we must be aware that the Philippines lies on the typhoon belt. So on a, on a yearly average, around 20 um, tropical cyclones enter the Philippine area of responsibility. Mostly hit, as seen in the graph below, is the agricultural sector, where farmers and fisher folks have a poverty incidence of 31.6 and 26.2% respectively, the highest among all basic sectors. It is also important that uh, we lay the foundations for bottom-up approach and community-based disaster risk management before we um, pursue the rest of the presentation. So when we talk of bottom-up approach and community-based, the first thing that comes to mind is the participation of the public and the people. Across literature, community-based disaster risk reduction and management is described as um, having communities engaged in identification, analysis, treatment, monitoring, and evaluation. The people are involved in decision-making and implementation. And um, there is involvement of the vulnerable groups, mostly by, um, most especially by vulnerable groups. And this is important for community governance because um, when they are actively participating, communities feel a sense of ownership, commitment, and accountability in these initiatives. And um, in one study, EcoWeb has this framework called Human Ecosystems Development, wherein they state if multifaceted root causes are not addressed together, then the vulnerabilities will continue and challenges will only compound. For this study, our main objective is to review the policy, institutional, and public investment aspects of DRRM in the Philippines and how they encourage bottom-up and participatory approaches. <clears throat> so specifically, we look at policy and institutional frameworks, and then um, we back map um, budget and expenditure at the national and subnational levels, and then we assessed how, how this public investment um, how this public investment are allocated and utilized and how they inform policy priorities. And then uh, we recommend ways to address these gaps. For our methodology, uh, we used a three-pronged approach um, using those three main aspects aforementioned in the objectives. And for mixed methods approach, we have a quantitative data from the DILG's full disclosure portal. So we encoded the LGU submissions for the RRM reports there. And then um, we triangulated this with, um, with KIIs and FGDs with our agencies and key experts and other stakeholders. For the first part of our results, we will be talking about policy. So in the global landscape, there have been a series of paradigm shifts. And um, it started from being reactionary, and then it eventually evolved to proactivity, covering long-term rehabilitation, sustainable development, poverty reduction, and good governance. 
And we're seeing that in the international agreements that Philippines is a part of and also our national climate policies. We, and we also have our SDGs. And um, our A10121 or the Philippine DRRM Act retained centralized mechanisms but mostly devolved its local functions. And our and RA 7160 or the local government code supports this devolution. So LGUs can utilize up to 5% of their estimated revenue from regular sources during calamities. So RA 10121 is the primary anchor of um, DRRM in the Philippines. And it has four pillars, prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, rehabilitation, and recovery. And in representation, um, the policy requires that there should be a multi-stakeholder council and that consultation should be present in crafting plans. There is also um, issuances that requires horizontal integration, which means local plans, DRRM plans, should be streamlined or included in development plans. So in 2013, as mentioned by um, President Orbeta earlier, um, there is a joint memorandum circular among um, NDREAM-C, DIALG, and DP DBM, which details the allocation and utilization guidelines of local DRM fund. In 2014, DILG issued a memorandum circular, which requires mainstreaming of disaster risks and climate change in local development plans. That's why we have now um, local DRRM plans and local climate change action plans. And they are, um, they are required to include it in their, in their comprehensive land use and comprehensive development plans. Other avenues for participation are mentioned in the Philippine Development Plan in the Strategic National Plan, Yogo Framework for Action, Sende Framework, and Paris Agreement. Okay, so this slide just shows you um, the ideal, um, ideal alignment of plans from the LGU to the provincial and national. So um, below the um, CDP, should be the um, barangay development plans. And barangays are also required to create barangay DRRM plans. So in the budget process, where is the public participation? Um, barangays actually can suggest um, a series of programs, projects, and activities during consultation. And proposals are consolidated for budget hearing by the Sangguniang Bayan. And um, LDREAM-O, or the local DRM office, can also propose DRR-related PPAs. And it is up to the LGU whether they would um, take up these um, this suggestions and um, include them in their um, annual investment plan. However, the local chief executive or our mayors can influence the direction of their priorities because of their executive legislative agenda. So. Um, overall, there is a need to look at the, at the alignment of development plans across levels and their respective uh, annual investment programs. So here we have the structure for NDREAM-C. Um, and there are four CSOs and one private organization required. This major structure should be ideally structurally replicated in the subnational levels. However, these pillars do not have equivalent departments beyond the regional level. So at the municipal or the city level, some LGUs identify stand-ins. So minsan po yung um, MDREAM O nila or yung um, local DRM officer ay yung MENRO or minsan yung municipal planning officer nila. So, um, so this... Um, structures show that hindi talaga nare-replicate yung four pillars beyond the regional level. So what are the existing um, climate change and DRR investments in the Philippines? What are our possible sources? Oh, so in the national level, we have the National DRRM Fund, which is a lump sum appropriation under GAA intended for relief and rehabilitation. And then we have the local DRR, LDREAM-F, which 
um, which should not be less than 5% of estimated revenue from regular sources. And then People Survival Fund, which is mandated by the Climate Change Act. So it's an annual fund that can be applied for by LGUs uh, and CSOs and people's organizations. And then we have the official development assistance, which are loans or grants that promote um, sustainable development and socioeconomic welfare. So this is just a breakdown of definitions and um, percentages. So particularly for Eldream F, that 5% is further divided into 70% and 30%. Now 70% is the mitigation fund and 30% is what we call as quick response fund. Quick response fund can only be availed or it can only be utilized once an LGU is declared under a state of calamity. If um if hindi siya na suspend, napupunta yung um the rest of the QRF into a special trust fund for the next five years. And if there are still unexpended funds from the um, special trust fund, then it will revert into the general fund, which the LGU can use for non-DRRM projects. So in some LGUs, which have very limited ERA, they tap the 20% local development fund to support their DRM projects. So here we're seeing um, a tagging mechanism by the Climate Change Commission called CSET. So climate change expenditure tagging. So they are tracking investment, climate change investment in the national programs, activities, and projects. And leading this is DPWH. And most of this are tagged as adaptation projects. This is followed by DA and um, DNR. So as you can see here, um, there is um, heavy um, allocations for adaptation. So um, actually um, priority varies according to agency. And when we look at um, annual budget proposals, sustainable energy PPAs are mostly proposed within the national expenditure program. However, um, GAA reorients towards water sufficiency strategy. So they authorize more funding towards water sufficiency strategies. So in GAA, um, authorized budget gears more towards adaptation, reducing proposed mitigation allocations across the years. So for ODA profile, 75.30% of it is um, related to DRR projects. Our biggest funders are JICA, France, World Bank, and G GF, and DPWH, and Department of Transportation are the recipients of this ODA loans or grants. And these projects are mostly tagged as DRR. DA follows third with the highest climate change adaptation investment, while the Department of Energy has the highest climate change mitigation on the other hand. So now I will turn you over to Dr. Domingo for the um, for the other um, fund sources. Okay. Um, thank you, Arvi, for the presentation of the initial slides. So Ms. Manihar was able to present to you avenues wherein we have uh, stakeholder participation. So from the region, province, city, municipal and barangay levels, we have supposedly structures within the bureaucracy for the community or other stakeholders to actually get involved in terms of looking at the RRM initiatives as well as decision-making, uh, engage in decision-making processes. But as also mentioned, uh, in terms of manifested participation from our stakeholders, we have very limited evidence uh, that, we have, that we were able to see. She was also able to present uh, sources of funding for climate change and disaster risk reduction management initiatives, both from the national and sub-national levels. And uh, I will be continuing in terms of uh, presenting more details now in terms of our national disaster risk reduction management fund, as well as the local DRRM fund that we have sub-national. So you have on your screen the public investment through our calamity fund. This is, as mentioned earlier, lump sum 
allocation every year through GAA, wherein we are given a very huge uh, amount for disaster relief, rehab, and related initiatives down the ground. What you have here are two versions of uh, the allocations. To your left is the monetary uh, allocation every year. To your right are adjusted figures because every year we have insertions in terms of priority spending. For example, we had before uh, Yolanda rehab funds inserted in our national DRR fund. Uh, in recent years, we also have funding for Marawi rehabilitation. Now we have a more detailed discussion probably coming from OCD later on because they have uh, a recent paper detailing uh, the utilization of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund. So watch out for that. So this is what you have in terms of our investment National DRRM Fund uh, over uh, several years now from 2009 to 2021. As you can see, uh, it seemed to, to increase over the initial years and then to uh, in recent years. What you have for 2022 is also around 20 billion of funding uh, with 1 billion allocated for uh, Marawi rehabilitation. And that is the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, as I've mentioned, uh, the previous slide was able to show uh, the National DRM Fund from 2009 to 2021. This is your breakdown for 2022, wherein you have 1 billion for Marawi uh, rehabilitation for a total of 20 billion. What's uh, seemingly different is that we have more allocation QRFYs you know, in terms of our quick response fund to the, uh, to the Department of Education uh, in the amount of 2 billion for the year. Um, as mentioned also earlier, such can be replenished uh, once you have uh, utilized a substantial portion of the figures presented. So you have DEPED, you have DSWD, you have DA, you have DPWH as the main recipients of the big amounts coming from our QRF fund. Next slide, Arvin. So institution-wise, uh, in aggregate from 2009 to 2020, you have here uh, DSWD as the main as the major uh, recipient of our uh, QRF allocations, followed by DEPED, and then uh, of course DA and DPWH. For uh, DSWD to receive such is very intuitive because they are uh, actually manning response operations and relief operations post uh, well, during and post. Uh, disaster events. So they require so much in terms of material input, both in terms of them pre-positioning and them reacting uh, upon uh, us encountering disaster events. Next slide, Harvey. Okay, so that was your national DRRM fund. Now we look at details in terms of the local disaster risk reduction management fund. This is not uh, as straightforward as our presentation uh, in the previous slides because we found it very difficult to actually look, to actually look at. There is no uh, summarized version of LGU reports you know, detailing, for example, their utilization of the 5% from their uh, useful revenues, regular revenue for DRRM-related initiatives. So we had to actually back map uh, for five years, looking at reports submitted by the LGUs to the DILG uh, full disclosure portal. So this is a very indirect way for us to come up with evidence in terms of local government spending on disaster risk reduction and management. It took us almost a year to actually come up uh, with the data set you know, from pre-coded uh, reports coming from our LGUs. And in many cases, we had issues in terms of number one, uh, consistency in the reports. Some of them uh, have submitted quarterly reports, which eventually did not total uh, to an exact amount. So we had issues in terms of the standard of reporting uh, coming from, from our LGUs. But then again, uh, 
the full disclosure portal of the ILG was very useful in terms of us actually getting evidence as to LGU spending. Uh, a caveat in terms of us going through the next slides is, well, we did the study in 2020 prior to the onset of uh, the pandemic and therefore those reflected in the succeeding slides do not account for our spending on COVID-related uh, engagements. Next slide, Ollie. So looking at the total allocation in millions by fund source from 2015 to 2019, we have it here, okay? QRF, your mitigation fund within our LGUs. So the two comprise the 5% uh, annual allocation from the regular sources of revenue. And then you have downloaded uh, resources coming from the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund. And uh, we also have sources coming from other LGUs, donations from their neighboring uh, LGUs and from other sources. So if you're going to total such, you'll find that uh, the actual figure indicated in the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund over the years are higher compared to the aggregate total from our local disaster risk reduction management funds subnationally. But uh, if you're going to look at the adjusted figures from the National uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund and compare that to what you have in this slide, we actually have more allocations com coming from the LGUs from the 5% uh, local disaster risk reduction management fund. So total utilization in the second uh, table, we have their presented uh, utilization per fund source. And it's evident that if you're going to compare the first and second tables, utilization rates are very low, yeah? not really reaching 100%, except in 2018, when you're looking at uh, funds coming from the other LGUs. So you have here uh, probably 100% utilization for funds coming from other LGUs, more than actually in terms of actual number, because you are looking at aggregate spending from sources from the previous years. Next slide, Ernie. So you have here the graph in terms of utilization rates by fund source, QRF, mitigation fund, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund as downloaded, funds coming from other LGUs as donated, and also sources from other entities giving to the LGUs. It's very evident that, uh, well, we have some optimal utilization of subnational funds, and although supposedly we have that huge resource to, to tap for local DRR-related initiatives, uh, we have seen suboptimal usage of such resource. And this is something that we can uh, really augment you know, in terms of the bureaucratic capacity subnationally for them to make use of such resources in the current. Next slide, are we? we you have here a presentation of the utilization rates by region and uh, the story is also consistent. If you're looking at the orange uh, or peach color uh, bar, the utilization rate really is, is very low. You know? And it's consistent uh, from the, the richest region, which is NCR, to the poorest, which is uh, ERMF. So you, you have here uh, really a scenario where we can do a lot in terms of us benefiting with current resources already in the hands of our local governments. And such is ironic because we have been hearing a lot of uh, anecdotal evidences saying that we need to infuse more resources down the line. And if our bureaucracy subnationally is unable to actually make use of such resource, then we have a problem. Next slide, are we? So you have here as well, the average local disaster risk reduction management fund allocation by region. Of course, you have the highest in the national capital region. Uh, and then down the line, you have uh, differences in terms of the actual resource. 
essentially based on what they have revenue-wise within the LGUs. Next slide, Harvey. So there enters the, um, the talk about inequities no, when it comes to the availability of resource for disaster risk reduction and management. Because essentially, if you're going to just look at the 5% local disaster risk, risk reduction management fund, then your poorer uh, municipalities or localities have much less compared to your richer municipalities or cities. In this slide, you have the various DRR and fund sources yearly average in millions. No? Accounted for is the 70% mitigation fund. In the left, in the middle, is a 30% quick response fund. And then your total for the local DRR and fund for all regions. So in the graph, you are shown as well the gap in terms of utilization and available fund, supposedly for LGUs. Next slide, Arvi. Now, this is the special trust fund where unutilized funding every year for the RRM reverts to. And uh, the policy is uh, this is available for five years before reverting to a common social fund, you know, which is more flexible. And a lot of our LGUs have been using uh, the special trust fund essentially to, to park their the RRM funding for a more flexible uh, usage eventually in the near future. That may be intuitive on, on their part no? because uh, they may have other sources of funding, but um, well, it uh, negates the, the presence of resources for the RRM uh, in the current year, no? if they're not going to use that for current concerns. So it's the same for the national DRRM fund as downloaded to our LGUs. Next slide, Harvey. So more graphs on the various DRRM fund sources. Yearly average in millions from 2015 to 2019. You have on top, upper left, your executive development fund. Upper right, transfers from other sources, including other LGUs. Lower left, transfers within LGU. And then international sources uh, in your lower right. So again, the story holds that uh, there is suboptimal utilization of such funding. Highest utilization is uh, in the international sources of fund, you know? probably because they are prompted to use this, uh, given uh, accounting and auditing requirements. Next slide, Arvi. So you have in this slide pie charts indicating the spending patterns, uh, taking note of what are LGUs have subnationally, resource wise, and the top 10 expenditure items uh, where they place their uh, local DRR funding in, into. So, in terms of spending patterns, there is more investment on infrastructure. And then, in terms of expenditure items, equipment predominates. And uh, of course, there are spending also in terms of capital outlay, evacuation centers. Uh, you have spending on food supplies for relief. And then uh, you have other items as indicated here. So what we see really is LGUs, well, it's, it's a landscape where in LGUs are given uh, the free hand in terms of them using what's available. Uh, within their, within their uh, coffers, no? DRRM wise. And they have different priorities, but uh, also they have consistencies in terms of what they want augmented resource wise or asset wise. And in this case, they want more equipment and really they want investment in terms of uh, concrete items, including the much usable evacuation centers required subnationally, not only uh, per province, but, but also per city and uh, municipality. Next slide, Ari. Okay, so just to summarize the challenges, no, uh, you are presented here the factors influencing subnational DRM, uh, resource usage. 
number and probably the RM related initiatives. Number one, uh, starting from the upper left, you have your non-institutionalization of the local disaster risk reduction management office. In some cases, you have the absence of um, plantilla positions for uh, the local DRR officer. Uh, absence of uh, a well-crafted local DRM plan, as well as uh, presence of capacitated staff. There are issues about them also looking at security of tenure because every three, every three years, some in some municipalities where they have changes in terms of local leadership, you also have changes in terms of DRM office leadership. Delays in planning and budgeting, which impacts a lot in terms of the barangays uh, coming into the picture and contributing to the overall planning process. And also them inputting the requirements uh, for the year, budget ones. Misuse and discharge of funds is probably is the main reason why LGUs are not really enthusiastic in terms of uh, using and liquidating their local disaster risk reduction management funds. Failure to transfer unexpended funds to the special trust fund every year. Uh, by doing so, you have a very chaotic counting of funding for the RM for several years. Arbitrary reporting as well. Um, as mentioned earlier, we actually benefited from the LGU submitting reports although not in a very standard way, to the DILG uh, full disclosure portal. And then silent representation in terms of uh, the presence of uh, the public in, in the platform for, for representation uh, in different levels, you know, from the barangay, municipal, city, province, and regional levels, as well as, of course, the, the national level, where you have the NTMC supposedly with uh, representations from CSOs. Next slide, Harvey. Okay, so I'm in my last three slides where we present key insights and ways forward. First one, the DRM landscape still largely top down, as we have seen uh, from evidences. Uh, there is limited community participation that is visible, and that which is visible is just through CSO representation. The Barangay uh, DRMM plan and probably the Barangay development plans are not really optimally being used by our cities and municipalities in terms of their uh, crafting their own CTPs and CLUPs. Such also highlights the entry point for private sector initiatives and also uh, contribution in terms of uh, such planning processes. There appears to be very minimal investment on participatory related PPAs. We try to score the GAA every year for the past 10 years and uh, it's quite difficult to actually see uh, very specific allocations for uh, participatory related initiatives, PPA wise. Okay. There is inequitable resource distribution uh, among LGUs, as mentioned earlier. If you have 5% of their um, regular revenues as source for the RRM funding, then it's intuitive that you see inequalities you know, in terms of the presence of resources uh, for each LGUs, as also differentiated by their different classes. There is suboptimal DRM fund utilization among LGUs, so regardless, as to whether an LGU is rich or poor or classified differently, there is the consistent evidence that there is optimal, well, suboptimal utilization of what is, avail what is available to them, DRM fund wise. Next slide, Harvey. National policy and international accords dictate bottom up participation but implementation processes remain ambiguous or even difficult. There is, ev uh, there is dependence on institutional leadership and spending in terms of grounding the R initiatives, both for national government agencies and LGUs. So you go to the LGUs and you see our 
local ch chief executives with uh, sort of dominance in terms of coming up with the with the final uh, construct of their annual budgets. You know? And uh, we need to balance that out in terms of us inputting more coming from priorities uh, as indicated in their uh, investment programs, medium term as well as for the annual investment program submitted coming from the planning documents. But the ILG's uh, full disclosure portal is a good platform for transparency and validation, but there has to be appropriate standards in place. Uh, well, just recently, they have actually upgraded uh, that platform. And now there is more standard in terms of these submissions coming from our local governments. And that's very much welcome. But we can uh, go another level uh, in terms of us coming up with better reports from our local governments and them actually possibly reporting more on the RR related uh, events and initiatives. Clear use of funds and reporting is needed. The separation for unexpended balances into trust fund and its use within and beyond five years need to be cleared as well. So accounts for donations should be maintained to ensure transparency and also ease of audit on the part of the national government. And of course, on the part of COA. Next slide. Our last slide. In terms of ways forward, we have to capacitate LTUs on DRR policy and fiscal management. So as evidenced by the suboptimal use of what's available to them, we need to empower them in terms of using uh, what's current in terms of assets and resources. And not really waiting for so many years uh, to capitalize on them. Strengthen institutional avenues for community stakeholder participation, including of course, our business community representation, implement more participatory TPAs, and be very explicit in terms of allocating resources to such. Enhance inclusion of your barangay development plans in our municipal and city level planning processes. Many cases, uh, our barangay inputs are sort of uh, neglected or not even the much needed space in terms of our upper level planning and of course investment programming. Institute stronger monitoring and evaluation system for plans, uh, including your programs, projects, and activities. And of course, the need for us to really tag DRR related funding and expenditure. And lastly, we need to enhance reporting and, trans and transparency platforms and possibly uh, us compelling our local governments to come up with yearly reports on disaster related initiatives and even events you know, in terms of the impacts of disasters in their communities. So that is the last uh, slide, I think. Harvey, uh, can you, so we just have uh, our, our, our thanks to give to you. And this is last time. We look forward to the open discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Sani Nudingo and Ms. Uh, R. V. Troy Manihar for your comprehensive and uh, insightful uh, presentation. Okay, so to continue our conversation, uh, we will hear the reactions and insights of our invited discussants who are experts and practitioners in the areas of uh, disaster uh, and, and risk reduction, uh, disaster risk reduction and management, public finance and governance. First, we will have our representative from the Office of Civil Defense or OCD, which serves as the implementing arm of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. And we have with us today, Mr. Benito Salvador Jr., Chief of the Policy and Research Section of OCD's Policy Development and Planning Service. From 2020, he is also the Acting Chief of the DRRM Fund Management Division. Mr. Salvador led the development of the NDRRM Fund Guidebook and the upgrading of the NDRRM 
Fund Information Management System. He's also an active member of the JICA Capacity Enhancement Program, which handles the development of local DRM planning policies, standards, and guidelines. Sir Ben, you may proceed. Thank you very much, um, Sheila Shar, and to uh, the Philippine Institute of, uh, for Developmental Studies for inviting me in this occasion. Would like also to acknowledge our partners who are attending this afternoon session. So with this, uh, let me share with you my reaction on the paper that was presented. So for the discussion overview, I also called out the key issues that were identified a while ago by Dr. Sani Domingo. And by the way, uh, Dr. Sani Domingo has been um, my panel chair when I was taking my master's in uh, crisis and disaster risk management. And the study that he was talking about is the assessment of the, local, of the national DRM fund management during the past six years. So going back to the topic. So the first is I will identify the key issues which are shared in the study, which are relevant to the mandate of OCD and the NDRRMC. We'll also share observations and tackle the issues identified. Then uh, I will present the workable solutions formulated, meaning to say the existing ones that we have in the government that this pertains to national standards, frameworks, and policies, and the proposed ones which is undertaken, for instance, the local DRM plan guidebook, which would answer a lot of issues that were identified a while ago. So for the role of the people, this pertains to the limited community participation. So the challenges that uh, is identified in the study is that the bottom-up approach was difficult to institutionalize in the already existing structure. Well, I would like to highlight as well the issues identified in the study. For instance, for the stakeholders, there's an issue of trust to the government. Hence, this leads to the sustainability of programs. For instance, the capacity building and technical knowledge. Then the other thing for the government, they are hesitant actually to According to the study, they are hesitant to um, join the stakeholders because of the expenses, as cited, for instance, is transportation, food, and honorarium. So we have here the proposed solutions. First is mainstream community engagement in the local DRM planning and budgeting process. The second is institutionalized people's participation in DRM activities. So let me expound on those solutions. So when mainstreaming community participation into the local DRM process, let me give you a glimpse of the working document that we have right now. Uh, we're working with this with Chaika, and that's actually the version three of the local DRM planning uh, guidebook together with the guidelines. So under uh, stage zero, this, there's the preparation of the local DRM planning. The purpose of which is to organize a local DRM planning team that would ensure first, here's where uh, community participation comes in, the active involvement of stakeholders, the risk in for local DRM plans, and the alignment to the national and related plans. So vertically and horizontally, we will ensure alignment of the plans. So next. So for the local DRM plan, and I would like to highlight these have very um, specific groups which are defined in the set kind. First is the core group, which is uh, the local DRM councils. They manage the overall uh, planning and implementation process of the local DRM plan. We also have here, this is actually a good initiative, the stakeholders group, where we involve the vulnerable sector. This is composed of organized groups, the women, the youth, the children, persons with uh, disabilities, differently abled, elderly, uh, LGBTQ, IDPs, and others. We also have the CSO. So as identified in the study, the local uh, aspect of DRM, this is where the CSOs come, comes in, but we add the vulnerable sector. So for the CSO, we have the faith-based organizations, the business, the academic, organized volunteer groups. And I would like to also highlight, it is also included uh, as a part of the team to include indigenous, indigenous peoples, uh, mandatory representative. This is uh, the area where IPs are um, dominating the community. We also have the PWD, uh, PWD Affairs Office, the institutions for peace and security for armed conflict areas, for example, the OPA. And also I would like to highlight uh, with the discussion a while ago of uh, Dr. Domingo, 
on the enhanced inclusion of the barangay DRM plants in the municipal or city um, level plants. In this uh, guidebook that is being developed, we also talked about the mandatory process, not just the content of the plan, because there are LGUs who are good in a, we have LDMOs or we have MPDC who can easily develop a plan. However, it is mandatory and it shall be mandatory and it would even be um, looked upon during the, um, the review of the OCD of the said plan, where we're going to look into the process we're in, these um, stakeholder groups should be also involved. Likewise, in developing the local DRM plan, it should also be reflective of the risk in the barangay level, since you have to revisit this barangay DRM plan. So that is guaranteed in this uh, working draft of the set policy. Next. So on institutionalizing people's participation in DRM activities, I would like to show you the entry fund releases per project type. So those highlighted in red were actually areas where um, CSOs, community, and stakeholders can actually directly participate. For instance, for cash assistance, which were determined by the SWD, their passive role to be changed into active roles when it comes to identifying the areas that needs um, su supplement or financial assistance from the government is very important. It also includes the resettlement. Hence, uh, in the resettlement program, the LGU state should also be properly involved. The agriculture and fisheries, the livelihood, the school facilities and equipment, the evacuation center and water facilities. However, for these last two, there has been um, agencies who cater to the needs and it has been provided at least for this year for evacuation center. DPWH provides more than uh, 2.5 billion pesos for the evacuation centers alone. Next. Also, we can, uh, based on the study that we conducted, we have here the chart of the non CCAM DRR and the CCAM DRR and the NGAs. The biggest chunk of the NDRM fund actually went to the NGAs. And the non CCAM DRR, which, are, which the vulnerable um, LDs belong, only got 24.1% of the budget of uh, 133 billion. They only got 32.258 million. So that's a very small portion, and we have seen uh, a while ago that there's a very um, there's a need to streamline the participation of vulnerable groups when it comes to funding. So what did we do? Next slide. So in 2021, the NDRRMC issued a Memorandum Circular 110, series of 2021, or the revised guidelines on the administration of the NDRRM fund. Now I would like to point you to the very important uh, part of the said um, guidelines wherein it actually developed criteria for prioritization. We have here the geographic vulnerability. So this pertains to the 22 highly vulnerable provinces, the coastal communities, and those which are living near the uh, situated, I mean, in the major river basins. So this has high, or this have high vulnerability LGUs. We also have the population density. High population density is equated to high vulnerability because of the issue of poverty and the like. Then we also have the poverty incidence. So we also have here, they, they were also provided with um, prioritization when, it, when they have high priority, I, I, mean, I mean high poverty incidence than the income class. So before, as you can see, um, cities and um, first class LGUs they got a big chunk of the uh, NDRRM fund, but now we're prioritizing the low income class LGUs. So hence if we total that, the score, and that, that would be the rank of the LGU. Meaning to say, if you belong to the poorer LGU and you belong to the coastal or highly vulnerable LGUs, will be given higher priority to the NDRRM fund access. So that's where equity uh, comes in when it comes to funding. Okay, next slide. We also developed a national DRRM fund guidebook for the purpose. So this was launched a while ago during the um, National Disaster Resilience Hours for the rehabilitation and recovery. So the guidebook also um, provides there to uh, enjoy and promote the participation of the civil society organization, especially in the monitoring and evaluation of projects on the ground. And later on, we're going to operationalize this in order for them to actually participate meaningfully in the um, conduct of the monitoring and evaluation, apart from the identification of the proper uh, projects that may be funded from the NDRRM fund. 
So later on at the end of my slide, I will share with you a QR code, which has, if you click, uh, you will go to the guide. Next. So other challenges, uh, LG spending. We have here inefficient use of the local DRM fund, where it creates a reactive stance on DRM, focusing on rescue, relief, and aid. So our focus now is aligning uh, public fiscal programming with national framework and plans and standards, integrate local uh, DRM plans with the local development and land use plans. So as you can see here, uh, the big chunk of the equipment that's actually for preparedness for response, and response, although it's a good thing we have evacuation center, but the rest mainly covers uh, immediate response. So in the study of Francisco, as mentioned in the, uh, in the study of uh, Dr. Domingo and Manihar, you have the factors for recovery time, include presence of evacuation centers, food alarm system, and strong community organization. But that should vary. Hence, next, we will present to you the NDRRM plan. So you should re revisit this. It actually pertains to the centrality of risk towards a safer, adapted, and disaster resilient Filipino communities towards sustainable development. And you can see there a green uh, part of the diagram. Uh, we should invest more in um, prevention mitigation. So next slide, uh, it actually has a, um, outcomes that we need to focus on. So in order for us to focus more on um, prevention and mitigation and resilience, we, we focus on these outcomes as uh, highlighted in red. Next is uh, the challenge is still on local government um, funding. So the question was actually raised a while ago by Dr. Domingo. Why were they not tapping into existing uh, special trust funds pools? So perhaps they found out because of this resource, both the reporting and clarity of fiscal guidelines or DRM fund was not a priority for public investment. So here are our proposed solutions. First, streamline reporting of DRM fund, inclusion of policy guidelines and programming of the special trust funds, then strengthen local investment programming strategies aligned with sustainable development. So let's tackle this. So COA provided actually a guidelines on this. So this is supplemented by JMC 2013-1. So this serves as the guide for the LGUs when it comes to reporting. Well, I would like to highlight on COA, perhaps you can strengthen more on the tag initially before you can have this across prevention mitigation, preparedness response and rehabilitation and recovery, not simply reporting the budget as is or in, ge in generic one. Next slide. So we also developed the NDRRM fund website. This is to complement and to actually streamline reporting. So this is just an example. And uh, the Office of Civil Defense is also developing one for the local DRRM uh, funds. So we have here, this is already online when it comes to NDRRM fund, and this will be uh, replicated by the national D local DRRM fund runner. So you can visit the website, ndrrmfund.ndrrmc.gov.ph. And if you click on the resources, those are the public domain. You can look there, the entry fund uh, releases for disaster type, the utilization, actual um, allocation, and uh, a lot more. So next. So for the formulation of the local DRM planning guide, we also highlighted the supplemental investment program based on the, not, not actually based on the study, but we actually seen this for the longest time that they are not able to tap this special trust fund. As we develop it and integrate it in the guide for the local DRM plan. So stage four, it provides first steps for the preparation of the supplemental investment program for special trust fund. You first review the availability of an expanded fund. Well, it has a technicality because the, uh, those budget from the local DRM fund and expanded, actually it's only the MOE that goes to the special trust fund. Those capital outlays remains the general fund until it is used by the LGUs. So 4.2B is to prepare the LDRM FIP for the STF, so special trust fund. We can just add this as part of the funding of uh, the 5%. And this should be approved by the Sangguniaan, by the council and by the Sangguniaan, and should be integrated in the plan in order for us to implement this. So, um, Last and not the least, here's the guidebook that I mentioned a while ago. So we would just like to share this with you. You can uh, just scan the code um, and this will direct you to the link. And um, 
that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Ben. We are grateful for your uh, re for your reactions to the uh, presentation as well as uh, your real recommendations and how to um, address the issues underscored by uh, Dr. Domingo and uh, Ms. Mantar. Okay, so we will hear more uh, from our uh, representative from OCD during the open forum. Okay, so let us now listen to the comments and insights of the Bureau of uh, Local Government Finance, an attached agency of the Department of Finance. And we are honored to have with us Dr. Maria Pamela Kizon, the Acting Deputy Executive Director of the BLGF. Um, her recent engagements include the development, design, and enhancement of the online reporting system of the DOF on local government fiscal and financial matters, the electronic uh, statement of receipts and expenditures system. She has also served as focal person and resource uh, person in capacity building activities for BLGF regional offices, local government units and other stakeholders and understanding the Bureau's policies on local taxation, revenue, administration, and public financial management. She was also instrumental in reviewing and providing technical inputs in the development of various manuals issued by the PLGF, including the e ESRE Manual, Resource Mobilization Manual, LGU Guide, Computerization, and Mass Appraisal Guidebook. Ms. Pam, the virtual floor is now yours. Hi, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, PIBS, and thank you for giving an opportunity to the Bureau of Local Government Finance to give our views and comments uh, on, on the study of Dr. Sonny Domingo, the re Senior Research Fellow of PIBS, and to Ms. R.V. Joy Manihar, the Research Analyst on Policy, uh, Institutional, and Expenditure Review of bottom-up approach to disaster risk reduction and management. Just to cup off and start off the conversation, now we're, BLGF will be looking at the views on the LGU side. So yes, we're very much aware of Republic Act number 101-21, where in uh, LGUs were granted greater flexibility towards disaster mitigation, preparation, response, rehabilitation, and recovery. So also in a flash, not just in the presentation earlier of Dr. Sunny, but also to our uh, fellow discussant this afternoon, uh, it was mentioned that in order to improve transparency and accountability in the use of LGM fund, a joint memorandum circular number 2013-1 were released on March 25, 2013 to serve as a guide for LGUs in the distribution and use of the fund. So let me give you some numbers also on the side of the BLGF. So the initial estimate, I think that will be on the next slide. The initial estimate that we have given this uh, data coming from the BLGF is that uh, for the year 2022 and 2023, yes, that will be the outline of our presentation. Uh, the last part will be the BLGF's comments and position. But let me give you now the numbers crunch out from our database. On the first table, you will see on the next slide, the Initial estimates of uh, the BLGF for fiscal year 2022 and 2023 LGM fund of provinces, uh, cities, and municipalities based only on the 5% of the national tax allotment, which serve as the low end. So we have two estimates presenting to you right now. Uh, and this is on the budgeting of the LGM fund. And based on the percentage of the NTA and the initial local revenue forecast, which serve as the high end. So the first uh, set of data you are seeing, the low end estimates, is getting the 5% out of the national tax allotment, while the high end estimates, uh, we add NTA plus the locally sourced revenue forecast that we have. So these are the numbers that were crunched. There will be a total estimated amount of 38.32 billion as the low end estimate 
up to 52.67 billion as a high end estimate if uh, we're going to see how much should the LGU be allocating for the LGM fund. So let's pull out some more numbers and that will be on fiscal year 2023. That's on the next slide. So in 2023 alone, you will be seeing that uh, the low end estimate will be 32.78 billion and the high end estimate for budgeting LGM fund will now reach up to 48.86 uh, billion. The next slide is some indicators following uh, those numbers that we have crunched. So from fiscal year 2018 to 2021, actual expenditures under the LG fund grew by an average of 41%. It was a uh, 9.5 uh, billion in fiscal year 2018 and went up to 28.44 billion in 2020, but declined to 19.55 billion in fiscal year 2021. So the percentage of the actual end dream fund expenditures were less than the 10% of the following. Uh, if you compare that to local revenues, if you compare that to internal revenue allotment, because previously uh, the national tax allotment is called the internal revenue allotment, and if you compare that to total operating income and to total operating expend expenditures during the last four years. So let me give you some picture on the next slide so that all those numbers can be put together in one table. There you go. So if we get those estimates versus the actual expenditure, then you will be getting those ratios that I've mentioned earlier. And that will be... Uh, the numbers you are seeing at the lower part of the table, which is the percentage of LGM fund to local revenues, to ERA, to total operating income, and to total operating expenditure. The next slide that we have as part of the discussion is the based on the actual expenditures. Now we're seeing from the day the study itself and from based on the findings of the study uh, there has been mention of low utilization yes calling it from our database or uh, statement of receipts and expenditures based on the actual expenditures of lgus and lgm fund the highest utilization rate was noted in fiscal year 2020 with a 66 percent while the lowest uh, was observed in 2018 at 41%. In 2021, we are seeing that the utilization rate settled at 52%. So if you've been wondering and I've been seeing at the chat box, saan nanggagaling ang mga data ng LDREAM Fund? So we just want to inform the IDS, OCD, and fellow colleagues in the government that we have been capturing the L Dream Fund piggybacking it on the quarterly submission of the local treasures via our statement of receipts and expenditures. However, and unfortunately, we have not yet partnered with OCD uh, and other national government agency on looking into and checking the accuracy of the data being reported to the BLGF, how we wish we can um, sit down and uh, look at these numbers that we have. So how about the BLGF comments on the key issues and recommendations? So that will now be on the next slide. Ah, so we're seeing the budget and expenditure versus national budget on Endrium. Yes, please, on the next slide. So we also uh, compared the two. So the total budget appropriation for LGs for LGIM, uh, our obser observation and finding is that it's greater than the budget appropriation for the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund set by the DBM. It is noticeable that the budget for LGIM uh, in comparison with NDRIM was a slightly higher in fiscal year 2020 
uh, to 2022, which can be attributed to the occurrence of COVID-19 pandemic. The DBM issued local budget circular number 124, dated 26 of March 2020, where LGUs optimized their available financing resources, especially the use of LGM fund for COVID-19 related programs and projects and activities. So let's pull up those numbers on the next slide. So here it goes. So if you look at and compare the LGM fund versus that of the NGM fund, it's the data that we have gathered for LGM is higher compared to entry. So given, given all these numbers, given all this observation, let me present to you now the BLGF comments on the key issues and recommendations. First one is a well-capacitated local government on policy framework and fiscal management. Uh, in relation to the devolution of functions to LGUs with the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia ruling in fiscal year 2022, the Department of Interior and Local Government, our oversight partner, the Department of Budget and Management, and the Department of Finance and other national government agencies were directed to strengthen the capacity development of the LGUs in public financial management processes, which includes the planning, budgeting and execution of LGM fund. The DOF through our office, the Bureau of Local Government Finance through its capacity building activities could develop programs that would help LGUs improve their fiscal management of LGM fund. The second comment that we would like to present in this forum is the absence of standard expenditure report four months makes monitoring and evaluation muddy across the thematic pillars that presented earlier. So to address this, it was mentioned that stronger M&E system should be instituted alongside budget tagging, similar to climate change expenditure tagging mechanism. Again, we would like to inform everyone that the Eldering Fund utilization data being captured right now uh, in the statement of receipts and expenditure reports submitted by the local treasurers to the BLGF on a quarterly basis could be a good jump off point on a standard reporting format. This could be improved to capture granular data on the actual utilization of the LGM fund. Moreover, since the local budget officers are also reporting in the LGU integrated financial tools, the, the system which captures SRE, Budget tagging of the LG fund to capture the PPAs could also be part of our system enhancement. How about the discussion of low amounts of utilization? And that will be on the next slide. Uh, as supported by the available data that we have. So of this bureau on the actual expenditures of LGUs, in LDRIM, its utilization is indeed low. So we have shown you earlier uh, how low it is. So on the next slide, it is uh, also there in, uh, it is likewise worth noting that RA 101-21 provides for the establishment of a local disaster risk reduction management office in every province, city, and municipality, and a barangay disaster risk reduction and management committee in every barangay, which shall be responsible for setting the direction, development, implementation, and coordination of the disaster risk management programs within their respective territorial jurisdiction. So, uh, so in addition, the unclear issuances of oversight agencies or spending preferences of local administrations and also add to that the lack of technical competencies of staff in these areas, which may be addressed through appropriate guidelines and capacity building interventions for the LGUs that will strengthen their capacities and capabilities to assume the devolved functions. So... I think this will be last on the note from the BLGF side, a clearer or more flexible mechanism on the transfer of LGM fund to other LGUs may be further explored to easily enable LGUs 
to support each other, especially rich LDUs that may provide funding support to disaster-prone and lower-class LGUs. So the last slide that we are being shown on the screen, please, you can get in touch with the BLGF through our Facebook and through our website. Thank you for this opportunity to give our comment to the paper presented earlier this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pam, for your uh, on-point uh, comments to the paper. Uh, we appreciate, ma'am, your reactions as well as... Uh, your recommendations and how we can we can address uh, the issues uh, pointed out by our presenters. We will hear more from uh, Ms. Pam uh, during the open forum. So, friends, for our last reaction, he invited a local government official to um, react to the issues highlighted by our presenters in this study, as well as share his LGU's DRRM experience. Let us all welcome the Vice Mayor of the Municipality of Abuyog, uh, Lemuel Gin Traya. Vice Mayor Traya honed his management skills while serving as director of the Don Orestes uh, Romualdez Cooperative from 2005 to 2013. And his public service in politics started in 2013 when he became a member of the Sanguni Bayan. In 2016, he was elected municipal mayor wherein he served for two terms. Vice Mayor Traya, sir, the, floor, the virtual floor is now yours. Hello po. Uh, good afternoon sa lahat. Uh, sa PDS, thank you for um, uh, inviting me to this forum. At sa lahat po ng 257 participants, welcome po sa ano natin, discussion. Share screen. So um, right now, I share ko po sa inyo uh, yung uh, konting history ng abu yung DRRM. Tapos I share ko din sa inyo yung approach namin sa policies, institutional and sa expenditures. Uh, yung history ng abu yung DRRM um, started in 2003 uh, under pasya ng MPDO namin. Tapos uh, headed by Mr. Rodolfo M. Cabias. Uh, in 2005, the Vice RRM Mayor, Vice Mayor, yeah. with all due respect, may I request you, Assistant, to uh, start the slideshow? Ah. <laughs> Full screen. Okay. Um, okay, while we are waiting for uh, Vice Mayor uh, Triad to share, okay. So you in case you have questions for our presenters, uh, please um, enter in them in our Q&A box. Yes, no. Okay, sir. Uh, it, it, it however, it is in presenters' view. Okay. Sir, from current slide. Okay, from beginning. Okay. C can you do okay, that? No, uh, no, sir. It's still... Okay. Can, <laughs> can you click from beginning, sir? Uh, uh, beginning na po. Uh, okay, however, it is in presenter's view. Oh, um, oh, oh. It, it is in, on uh, using presenter's view, sir. Yes. yes. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes, it's okay now. You may you may proceed. Hi, good afternoon, sa ating lahat. Um, this afternoon I will be sharing yung DRRM approach namin, tapos yung policies, uh, institutional at saka yung expenditures. Uh, first off, uh, share ko muna yung uh, brief history ng MDRRM mo namin. Um, 
In 2003, uh, yung MDRRM, DRRM mo namin was under the office of the MPDO headed by Mr. Rodolfo M. Cavias. In 2005, DRRM mo was institutional, institu institutionalized in line from the Hyogo framework. In 2010, Republic Act 10-121 in, was enacted in the Philippines. And in 2011, Republic Act 10-121 is in full sway, DRMO, our DRRMO is now operational. In 2017, uh, meron na kaming local DRRMO headed by Mr. Eric Barcelo, who is actually with me right now. So yung DRRMO approach namin sa barangay level, uh, nag-form sila ng BDRRMC. Next, uh, community res risk assessment then community participatory planning, then implementation. Uh, uh, yung sa local level naman, uh, the formation of the LDRRMC, kung saan na, nandun din yung local risk assessment, and MDRRMC quarterly meeting and planning, and then the implementation. Sa policies naman, uh, base sa Republic Act 10.121, yung DRRM namin ay may partners. Siyempre, una doon yung national government, then the local government, tapos yung civil society organization and private sector, and then the community. Sa policies, uh, may mga memorandum of agreement kami and memorandum of understanding with, uh, with the local suppliers namin. For example, sa food, uh, we have a MOA with Nicolex Rice Store kung saan if may disaster dito sa Abuyog, yung supply nila is ibibigay sa LGO para as relief para sa mga victims. Sa medical side naman, may mga pharmacy kami na nakamuha, uh, yung microbase pharmacy, Gracos Pharmacy, at saka yung core diagnostics. Sa manpower naman, may mga... Uh, volunteers kami dito, yung B929, GBI, Kabalikat, PARDS, GRRI, AMO, uh, Fraternities and Sororities, and they are as uh, force multipliers. Sa evacuation sites, may mga uh, selected schools kami dito na ginagamit namin as evacuation sites. Kasama na yung uh, isang building namin dito na donated by the Australian government na ginagamit namin as evacuation center. Nakamuha din kami sa funeral homes dahil sa MDM namin, yung management of the dead and the missing. Yung St. Peter's Funeral, Mantilla Funeral, and Bonifi Funeral. This is an avenue for activation and participation of the DRRM partners. Sa institutional naman, um, Yung MDRRMC namin is for updating pa kasi may, may change of administration. Uh, previously, ako yung chairman uh, because I was the mayor then. Right now, I am the vice mayor. Yung bagong mayor namin, siya na yung chairman. Uh, for updating, updating pa po ito, as mandated on the Republic Act 10 -121, the LGU fill in required members composing the MDRRMC. We also have identified CSOs and in the... In the private sectors. <clears throat> uh, yung municipal disaster management namin, may response team kami. Uh, yung early warning response team, which is kumpo, uh, yung team leader namin is yung MDRRMO namin. Tapos yung bawat team, uh, may kasama po yan na SB member in charge. Yung dito sa early warning, yung isang konsyal namin, si Honorable Antonio Almendra. Yung second team is search and rescue and retrieval. Uh, yung team leader pa rin namin is yung aming MDRRMO. Tapos yung SB member in charge namin, si Honorable Jeanette A. Balida. Uh, train po ito siya ng uh, SAR, search and rescue and retrieval. Sa medical naman, uh, sa Evacuation and Transportation Response Team, uh, yung team leader namin is yung MGSO namin and may SB member in charge din siya, si Honorable James Bohol. Yung sa camp management naman po and relief operations, yung team leader namin is yung MSWDO namin, si Ma'am Luz Concha K. Daganso, tapos may kasama din siya na SB member in charge. 
sa clearing and rehabilitation response team, yung team leader namin is si Engineer uh, Norbito Ibahan, um, head ng General Services Office. Tapos may kasama din siyang SB member in charge. Sa security and response team namin, naman namin, yung team leader namin is yung PNP, kasama yung AFP, yung GBI o Guardians, tapos yung Barangay Concerns na, yung Barangay Officials na ng Barangay Concern. Tapos kasama namin si Honorable er Erwin P. B. Bilyesa. Sa supply and logistics naman namin, uh, yung team leader namin is si Edgardo Bilio, uh, Municipal Budget Officer namin. Uh, sinamahan din siya ng isang SB member, si Honorable Benito C. Sa Rapid Damage Assessment and Needs Analysis Response Team, yung team leader namin is yung MPDO namin ngayon, uh, Mr. Rodolfo M. Cabias. Yung dating SB member in charge dito is si Honorable Octavio J. Traya, who is now our mayor today, so ito i-update namin ito. Now, yung abuyog, uh, aside lang sa uh, disaster, yung ginagawa ng MDRRM mo namin is nagpupunta kami sa pinupuntahan namin yung iba't ibang barangay para to educate yung community. Uh, fami yung family disaster preparedness plan. Uh, yung inuuna namin yung four piece na mga beneficiary. Uh, then after that, uh, siyempre yung mga yung mga training sa community, community managed DRRM or the CBDRRM training. May school-based din kaming DRR uh, through GIC, DepEd, and LGU Aboyog. Uh, dito sa Climate and Disaster Exposure Database uh, given to us by UNDP, assisted by the Australian Aid through RAPID. Uh, dito sa Aboyog, may mga contingency plan kami. Um, Uh, sa flood, storm surge, tsunami at saka earthquake. Uh, in a way, um, focus talaga kami sa preparedness. Yung Municipal Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Plan namin, uh, tinulungan kami ng World Bank, uh, assisted by DILG and the Office of the Civil Defense. Yung Climate and Disaster Risk Assessment namin, uh, UNDP din yung tumulong sa amin, yung USAID through RAPID and HLURB. Sa Local Climate Change Action Plan namin, UNDP din yung tumulong sa amin, Australian Aid, tsaka True Rapid at yung DILG. Uh, dito sa Abuyog, yung may forest land use plan din kami, um, may Enhanced Comprehensive Land Use Plan o ECLUP, uh, meron din kami yung Comprehensive De Development Plan Plus, CDP Plus yan, Uh, tapos, we do uh, earthquake drills and tsunami drills. Simultaneous school-based earthquake and tsunami drills. Bali, lahat ng schools dito sa Abuyog, inside the poblacion, kung saan um, susceptible kami sa tsunami, meron kaming drill dito. Ngayon, may ongoing plan kami for formulation, formulations, yung Integrated Coastal Resource Management Plan, BFAR, through BFAR and DA. Meron din kaming higasaan watershed characterization and integrated water management plan formulation through DNR and CENRO. Meron din kaming sustainable land management study through BSWM slash DA and UNDP slash uh, dash GEF. Five. Yung DRM, DRRM operations namin uh, sa nung Bagyong Agaton, nagkaroon kami ng relief operations, uh, rehabilitation and recovery phase activities, katapos di pa rin mawawala yung COVID response, tapos continuous hazard and risk assessment, weather and area of responsibility monitoring, and syempre yung information uh, dissemination. Yung DRRM tactics namin dito sa Abuyog, uh, syempre formulation and furnishing local plans to so DRRM, uh, climate change plans, thorough risk and hazard assessment, enlisting all possible, possible needs, projects, programs, and activities, securing MOA and Memorandum of Understanding, acknowledging and encourage DRRM partners and participation. So dito, 
uh, awareness, uh, preparedness, security, sustainability, and investment yung ginagawa namin. Sa expenditures naman, uh, base sa uh, 70% ng uh, 5% namin, in 2017 to 19, hindi namin na maximize talaga yun. Uh, kasi we were saving uh, pero in 2020 because of the pandemic um, medyo malaki yung expenditure namin pero hindi pa rin nauubos kasi we, we still have to set aside certain amount of money para sa ano uh, uh, mga ba climate mga bagyo uh, in 2021 uh, minanage namin ng maayos yung expenditure namin, kinontrol namin, hindi kami masyadong nag-spend sa COVID response kasi alam namin na may, uh, every year talaga may bagyo naman talaga na dumarating. So ito yung allocation at utilization namin. Sa 70% namin, ito yung utilization namin is yung orange na line tapos yung appropriation namin is yung blue na line. So sa funding and utilization process, uh, sa barangay level, ito yung barangay level namin gani, uh, na pinit, pinakita ko sa inyo. Pero yung sa utilization process, dumadaan sila sa bookkeeping and accounting office. Then the we prioritize the projects, programs, and activities. Barangay ang nagpipili nun. Um, MD, tapos tinecheck ng MDRRMO ang BDRRM FIP. Then after that, sinisigure ng barangay ng resolution para sa mga PPAs na kinakailangan nila. Then uh, next is the purchasing process. Uh, M MDRRM mo, minomonitor ng MDRRM mo yung mga PPAs nila na pinurchase nila. Next, uh, monitoring and evaluation still. And then sa local level naman, uh, may process din sa budget office. Then MDRRMC, yung quarterly meeting namin, yung council, yung uh, gumagawa ng planning kung anong ipapurchase na PPAs. Then pag nagawa na yun, gagawa ng MDRRMC resolution, tapos isusus ko forward sa sangguniang bayan for their resolution also, then purchasing process na. Then after the purchasing, uh, idodocument ng MGSO, tapos monitoring and evaluation. Now, yung challenges namin dito, uh, I think same din ng challenges ng ibang MDRRMO, uh, yung utilization process po. Uh, una, uh, tulad ng uh, document na pinorward nyo sa akin, uh, I can see, uh, nabasa ko na finding din ito sa inyo, yung faulty and delayed financial report for the RRM fund allocation to be utilized annually. Yung pangalawa, um, ito, common problem ito namin dito sa Abuyog, uh, non-clarity of COA, DBM, DILG guidelines on utilization of DRRM fund. Kasi minsan, may approved ng COA, approved ng DBM, hindi naman approved ng DILG. Minsan, approved ng COA, approved ng DILG, hindi approved ng DBM. So, medyo conflicting sila. Next, uh, the RRM fund is not enough for some PPAs pro, uh, and programs, program projects. For example, yung mga malalaking programa, hindi kaya ng, ano, ng pundo ng DRRM. Uh, uh, mostly, this happens in the barangay level kasi yung ano nila is fund is hindi ganun kalaki. So, <clears throat> yung isa pang challenge namin is the provision of omnibus of some authorized store shops that don't have omnibus. So ito, I think, uh, in with other LGUs, may da na, mayroon din ito. Sa other challenges naman, sa political, uh, sa, barang sa barangay ito nangyayari kasi yeah, fre mas frequent sila nag-change ng administration. Sa legalities, yung dito nangyari sa Buyog, uh, like what happened this year in April 12, nagkaroon kami ng landslide, tapos uh, hindi namin ma-utilize yung fund namin kasi nga uh, there is a uh, election ban. So yung mga procurement namin, hindi namin magawa yung mga kailangan namin gawin. So sa chain of command naman, 
in complying requirements office like office of the civil defense ocd and department of interior and local government the llg has its own different approach in drrm in complying drrm plan each office has its own version for us lgu to comply drrm guidelines are not fully unified giving confusion in complying paperwork so yung four work challenges naman sa workforce kasi based sa Republic Act 10121 DRRM mo composition yung uh, is composed of local DRRM office officer tapos dapat may tatlo siyang part yung administrative tra and training research and planning operations and warning so dito yung challenge namin medyo po lang lang kami sa staff um uh, it is need it is as SGLG findings the office should have at least have a maximum of 30 personnel to man a first class municipality so ngayon uh, 22 pa lang yung personnel ko sa MDRRMO so siguro hiring pa kami so that's it um uh, thank you po Maraming salamat din po, Vice Mayor uh, Traya, for sharing it with us your uh, LGU's experience in the RRM and for your candid remarks po on the challenges that uh, you're facing in terms of utilizing funds, in terms of reporting, which actually are consistent with what our presenters uh, uh, told us uh, kanina po, nung nag-present po sila ng paper nila. Okay. So at this point, uh, we have heard the presentations of our resource persons and the insights of our discussions. And this time, we would like to hear from you. So we have come to the next part of our webinar, which is the open forum. But before that, I'd like to inform you that we don't have a poll, but we will have a raffle wherein we will randomly select two winners from Zoom and one uh, from Facebook, and each of them will receive a prize. And I will announce the winners of our raffle before we close the webinar. Okay, so I invite all our speakers, Dr. Domingo, Ms. Manihar, uh, Mr. Salvador, um, Dr. Kizon, and Vice Mayor Traya to join us in the open forum. And let me start with the first uh, question. Okay. Um, okay, we have a question regarding uh, the creation of a new government body in charge of uh, disaster risk reduction and management. And Dr. Antonia Avila has this question. Do you favor the creation of the Department of Disaster, Re disaster Resilience? What are the advantages and disadvantages that you see? And if yes, what key features do you want to be included in the proposed law? His question is actually uh, related to uh, um, the question of Circes uh, Hibanada. He said, uh, okay, uh, well, he related his question to the um, earthquake that we felt uh, yesterday, and he said that as a response to this disaster, um, one of the senators stressed the need to create a new government body tasked to respond to natural disasters. Is this measure necessary or redundant given that the NDRRMC is already exist? Okay, may we hear from our... Uh, 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 presenters first, uh, Dr. Domingo Sani, would you like to take a crack at this question? Then I will uh, go to the rest of our panel panelists. Yes, yes, uh, Sheila, thanks. Uh, I can seem to open my video. <laughs> okay, it's, it, it's okay. Uh, you may, you may okay. go ahead. Yes, it's okay now. We can now see you, Sani. Thanks, thanks Sheila. So, yeah. Well, it's a very interesting question, and it's been a question we've been trying to answer for the past uh, three or four years. You know? During the time of President Duterte, he has been uh, consistently uh, mentioning in his sonas that uh, he wants that new Department of Disaster Resiliency. And right now, the uh, rationale for having such is still the same, and uh, we are being pressed to come up with a very effective institutional platform for disaster risk reduction and management. What we have now is NDMC, and NDMC is being backstopped by the National Secretariat, which is OCD. In the uh, supposed midterm review or sunset review of RA 1021, it was flagged that we need to augment um, institutional leadership in terms of the RRM. And probably 
the straightforward answer there was the creation of a new department. But uh, I guess right now, just hearing from the new administration, they are not inclined uh, to having another uh, buy into creating a new disaster resilience department. And they want to just strengthen the existing institutions. From my side or from my point of view, I think creating a new institution for disaster resilience, including emergency response, is very much a worthwhile undertaking for the bureaucracy. We need, may not be a new department, maybe an agency, but it has to be a concrete authority on the RRM. Why? Well, of course, we are going to spend more no, in terms of establishing, uh, augmenting an institution for the RRM. But we need uh, an established concrete institution that will grow uh, progressively over time, an institution that will mature over time as well. And that can only be done through an authority, maybe a department, maybe an agency, uh, an upgrade of what NDREAMSI is or an upgrade of what NDCC was. So not just uh, an ad hoc body, but really uh, a solid institution that will um, oversee and probably implement all our DRR-related initiatives. Mm -hmm. So my answer uh, uh, in a concise form is, well, I am in agreement in terms of the creation of a new department or authority, subject, mm -hmm. of course, to the availability of resources. Uh, from our national countries. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Asani, for your clear stance on this uh, issue. Okay, let us hear what our representative from o e OCD has to say about this. Uh, Sir Ben, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, once again. So as to the uh, creation of the Department of Disaster Resilience, we, we stayed on a neutral stance whether to create a department or an authority. However, uh, if we're talking about elevating the current Office of Civil Defense or the NDRMC, being a council into higher authority, that is necessary. And that is actually the result of the Sunset Review, which was conducted by the Cong uh, Congress last 2015, as mandated in RA 1121. So uh, for the features of the department, essentially that would uh, either be a department or an authority, um, it would ease bureaucratic processes. For instance, right now under the NDRMC model, we need uh, the council to convene in order for us to, to um, recommend to the president to the declaration of state of calamity. Imagine if it's a department or authority, we can directly go to the president and uh, ask him to declare that. That would be the process would be easier and faster. Likewise, another feature that was being uh, discussed uh, is uh, anti anticipatory action. So, Right now, we have the declaration of the state of calamity, but we go for anticipatory action, meaning to say we can uh, declare imminent uh, danger, meaning to say before uh, disaster strikes, for instance, uh, hydrometeorological hazards like typhoon, we can declare a uh, state of imminent danger and we can uh, now mobilize funds. Like uh, now, if uh, we can only tap URF if they're being struck by a disaster. Another thing for the cons, we have different versions of that. There's this version which is uh, predominant in the in the Congress, the abolition of councils, where this is contrary uh, to the principles of whole of government and whole of society approach that is being uh, espoused by uh, by uh, by uh, the Philippines. You know, for instance, um, we have a champion DRRM and being recognized for the spirit of Bayanihan that stands for our Filipino resilience. Imagine if we don't have council. And it, this would uh, very be detrimental to our um, national government and LGUs. For instance, we have now local DRM councils so catered to COVID-19. But if you remove the council, imagine the local DRMOs, which are not institutionalized and have limited staffing, will cater to all of this. So um, that's very dangerous. Um, but uh, besides the fact, we, could, we should also consider the functions. We should ensure that there's no redundancy in the departments that, uh, that are um, existing currently. This is in line with the president's um, vision or a policy on right sizing. We should maximize and optimize our uh, resources. Uh, then uh, the cost, which is mentioned also by uh, um, Dr. Sani Domingo. We should also uh, look into the cost, the funding. Currently, we are uh, having a world crisis and the government 
should prioritize its spending uh, mostly for uh, those vulnerable and which uh, would affect actually our economic um, uh, state. So that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ben Salvador of the OECD. OCD. Okay, let us hear the thoughts of our um, official from uh, the PLGF, Ma'am Pam, from a public finance point of view. Do you think this is uh, a worthy proposal? Uh, Sheila, again, I'll take off. I'll be on the very safe side. And I'll okay, ma'am. From the sauna address of our president, please. Uh, we noted that the first priority program, legislative program that we lined up is the National Government Right Size right Program. Yeah, so I'm taking off from that side. And you know us from the Department of Finance, we're very much um, conscious of what we call the fiscal space. Mm -hmm. So every time that there's a proposal to create a new office, we always defer that to the Department of Budget and Management mm -hmm. because they would know uh, the, the, the efforts, the, the, the comprehensive strategic view of all the national government agencies right now. They are very much aware of the uh, different uh, functions operations, mm -hmm. organization, and systems and processes of this department. So if there will be a creation of new department, then we'll have also to secure uh, an opinion coming from the DBM. From, but from the Department of Finance side, side, as long as there's fiscal space to mm -hmm. get the budget on, and then I think we're okay with that. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much, Ms. Pam. Okay, um, for this question, I'll skip uh, um, VM Trial from answering it, but may I ask uh, for his response to this other question, which is on the LGN's role in the implementation of the DRRM, and Jean Centeno has this question, how do you see the implementation of the Mandanas ruling affect the implementation of the DRRM among LGUs? Any recommendation to push further efforts to strengthen LGU's ability to respond to disasters? Uh, actually, this was covered by uh, the uh, presentation of uh, Ms. Pam, of our official from the BL BLGF. In, and in, uh, I think she mentioned that um, the DILG, the DBM, and the uh, Department of Finance and other government agencies were directed to strengthen the capacity for LGUs in public uh, uh, financial management processes. Okay. Um, VM Triya, Vice Mayor Triya, may we hear your, your uh, response po to this question. How do you see the implementation of the uh, M Mandanas ruling affecting your implementation of the DRRM? From your point uh, of view, oh, sir. Actually, maganda naman yung resulta uh, dito sa Abuyog kasi yung Mandanas ruling, there was an increase in budget. Mm -hmm. um, kaso nga lang, next year, there is a decrease in budget. So we have to manage it. Uh, dito sa Buyog, uh, <clears throat> uh, nagamit namin ng maayos yung pondo, tapos okay naman po ang yung ano, Mandanas ruling. Uh, yung effect lang niya dito, when it comes to MDRRMO, increase of funding lang. Unlike mm -hmm. other departments na uh, iba yung epekto ng ano, Mandanas ruling, may kasamang ano, mga guidelines. Dito sa MDRRMO, there was just an increase of funding. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Traya. May we hear the thoughts of our other uh, uh, this, or of our other speakers? Because uh, it is evident that there was low ab absorptive capacity in, in in their fund utilization. But having more, and and then here's here comes the Mandanas ruling that will give them more funds, additional funds, additional resources. Uh, May we hear from our uh, speakers? Uh, Sunny, would you like to uh, provide your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, Sheila. Again, another interesting uh, discussion. We are augmenting uh, funding subnationally through the Mandanas ruling when they have uh, in record suboptimal utilization of existing funds. Yeah? But eventually, they use the funds. They just don't use them currently because 
Number one, uh, as uh, Vice Mayor Lemuel mentioned earlier, they were a bit confused about policy and policy implications in terms of using the LDRIM fund. So probably if we capacitate more the LGUs, mm -hmm. they'll be able to absorb better such additional funds. And I'm in the position uh, in terms of looking at everything. And I see, I, I see that uh, additional funding, additional resource really is uh, for the betterment of BRRM, both nationally and subnationally. May they be used optimally at in present time or in the near future? That is really a question of how efficient the bureaucracy is. No? But uh, I think the more we give into the RRM, resource-wise, the better. Um, we can only build on what we have right now, improve on additional assets, additional capacities down the line, and eventually uh, we'll reap the, the fruits of, of such uh, investments. So we may be inefficient right now in terms of using resources, but uh, such should not be uh, reason enough for us to cut additional funding uh, to our institutions in government. Thank you, uh, Sunny. Ms. Pam, you mentioned about uh, capacity building of our LGUs in public uh, financial management processes. Uh, would you like to tell us, uh, you know, um, examples of uh, projects or programs that are uh, currently being implemented by, you know, the concerned agencies regarding capacity development of our LGUs. Yes, Sheila, uh, the Bureau of Local Government Finance says the Capacity Building Division. We have a menu of uh, capacity building programs that we are offering every year. Right now, because of Executive Order 1, 38, we are focusing on resource mobilization. Earlier on, I've heard the vice mayor mention, uh, ngayon mataas si NPA, next year mm -hmm. bababa siya. It's because three years before, bumaba din kasi si BIR collection and the BOC collection because of COVID at pandemic situation of the country. So, ngayon pa lang sinasabi na namin sa LGUs, ready yourselves kasi the 15% decline mm -hmm. in national tax allotment will really pull your resources. So it's a good time na to look at your local resource mobilization yes. program. And that's where BLGF is um, helping the LGUs. Yes, we have uh, capacity building programs. You please look at our website if you're interested to join us. We are offering that uh, all year round. We are also partnering with the uh, Philippine Tax Academy on this program. Right now, we are partnering with DILG for the NEO program. We are also there to give advice and uh, give uh, some brief lecture because it's lang yung oras sa NEO program, uh, an overview of resource mobilization and revenue generation program that we have, Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pam. Okay, let's jump to another question. Uh, this time from Ana Rita Ramirez. How does the LDRIMO cut across the other offices when it comes to disaster response? Is there an organizational framework that supports com the complementarity of functions? Uh, as far as I know, the LDRIMO is an inter uh, interdepartmental body, so it includes the local health office, it also includes the social uh, welfare office, etc. So there's really, it, it's, it's really a comprehensive. Uh, um, office within the L within the LGU. May we hear from the OCD? Uh, and could you please provide us, uh, the, uh, you know, your input to this question, uh, Sir Ben? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, um, it might be true that in the findings of uh, uh, Dr. Domingo, we don't have vice chairs in, at the LGU level when it comes to uh, disaster um, prevention and the other uh, thematic areas. But when it comes to a response, how does a response cut across the different uh, departments of the LGUs? Well, actually, the LGUs uh, from the national level down to the local, the IDRRMC established the so-called um, response clusters. So it was adopted from the United Nations wherein um, those agencies are clustered into uh, the different uh, subclusters. For instance, we have health, we have logistics. So um, various agencies are heading these clusters. 
at the LGU level, those, for instance, MHO, they had these uh, response clusters. Mm -hmm. And um, for uh, references, you may refer to the document. You can search this online, the National Disaster Response Plan. So they're in, uh, they're in it um, specify the interoperability of various um, government institutions vertically and horizontally. So you may use, uh, you may refer to that document. Mm -hmm. So that's the National Disaster Response Plan. So it's actually three documents. Mm -hmm. Sir Ben, uh, if I may uh, throw another question, because one thing that struck me in your presentation was your uh, explanation of the DRRM planning guide, which actually I think is a very good resource for our LGUs. But uh, how sure are how sure is how sure are you that this is really being utilized by our LGU, sir? Well, uh, on the matter of the local DRM planning guide, that version that I presented is the version three that is still uh, under development. So uh, JICA has just finished the conduct of pilot testing, and that is not yet approved by the council. So there's no uh, document yet when it comes to the local DRM planning, but there's a document on the local DRM plan uh, review. So it also specifies there in the timeline. So what could be the context, the content, and uh, the forms that could be um, used and likewise, the various um, cross-cutting uh, cross principles, for instance, uh, gender. Uh, then uh, we also have DRM inclusivity. However, that document is uh, still expounded with this uh, current uh, version that we have. So hopefully, if not the second um, quarter of the year, before the end of the year, we will be able to push through with that document. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Ben. Okay, let's uh, spend a little a little bit more time on uh, on the LGMO. And and Dr. Antonio Havel has this question: Is it true, aside from non -institu institutionalization of of the LGMO, that most of the DR L DRRM councils are not active, and that there is a need to capacitate the members of the council in every LGU level? Okay. Um, okay. Sunny, would you have anything to say about this question based on your uh, uh, study, based on, on the your key informant interviews? Yes, you know. Um, well, essentially, what you have within LGUs are uh, different cases, no? different situations, different cases, different mainstreaming of DRRM, including the mainstreaming of the DRR office within the LGU. But in, in all of them, uh, improved capacitation really is a very much welcome um, mm -hmm. initiative. So that, that may be the unifying element. So we keep on improving uh, capacity-wise. And then, of course, we safeguard 10 years you know, uh, among those offices because every three years you have your local elections and you have changes in terms of LCEs uh, every now and then, and some LCEs have their preferred personnel manning such offices. But if we want continuity, if we want to sustain what we have built upon from previous years, then we need to keep people, uh, more mm -hmm. specifically good people. So mm -hmm. tenure security probably is key in terms of us uh, having stronger uh, DR offices down the line. Mm -hmm. So, so Sunny, you're saying that uh, the uh, the local dream or, or the, let's say the municipal uh, DRM officer, it's it's not really a plantilla position in the LGU. No, it should be. It should be a plantilla position uh, by policy. But in some cases, uh, there are still uh, offices that are manned by designated uh, mm -hmm. officers. So, for example, some MTDOs are designated as. Uh, also, concurrent uh, DRR officer or the men roast designated as concurrent uh, DRR officers. But the end goal really is to have that uh, that strong plantilla structure within the LGU mm -hmm. uh, in terms of manning DRR related concerns. Mm -hmm. Abuyog, uh, we recommended really Abuyog because Abuyog is a very progressive example of an LGU mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a good structure. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor actually mentioned mentioned uh, MPDO Rudy 
MP Do Rudy used to be the DRR officer, and and mm -hmm. I think until now he's been guiding the DRR office. No? So they have a very good example that we can emulate or probably um, multiply no, in terms of approach in other localities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sunny. Vice Mayor Chaya, um, maybe have your inputs, please. Sir? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we were talking about uh, the uh, El Dreamo and uh, the fact that uh, as, as what, ha what has been seen in other uh, LGUs, uh, most of the LDRM councils are, are not active. But uh, Dr. Domingo said that, uh, you know, if there's one a model that we can emulate, it's the model being uh, used or that can be replicated in in other LGUs. It's the, um, it's the Abuyog model. Uh, yes po. <laughs> um, dito sa LGU ng Abuyog, lahat po ng uh, head of offices, lahat ng SB members, dumaan po ng basic ICS training. Uh, level 1 po kaming lahat. So, uh, when it comes to preparedness, uh, hindi lang sa pagyayabang, but we know what to do. Um, lahat po dito ng mga official may 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 mga sarili silang trabaho. Totoo 'yun. Uh, sabi ni uh, Sir Sunny Domingo, uh, si Sir Yudong Cabias, siya yung una unang humandol ng MDRRMO namin. And, and it's true. Um, until now, marami pa siyang mga input sa MDRRMO office. Actually, I have with me right here yung MDRRMO officer ko, uh, si Sir Eric Barcelo, siya po yung MDRRMO. Uh, we, we, we still seek the assistance of our MPDO kasi magaling yun si Sir Yudong Cabias. Totoo po. And you mentioned a while ago that you have uh, more than 20 staff yung pong inyong uh, um, uh, DRM sure. office po, sir. Um, ano percentage po doon ang contractual at anong percentage po ang permanent uh, staff? Um, yung actually 22 to be to be exact, uh, yung contractual na lang is I think uh, tatlo, tatlo, tatlo mm -hmm. yung contractual na lang. Uh, uh, yung regular is I think uh, seven, tapos yung iba is casual pa lang. So, on the way na po. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Traya. We have another question for you, and this time is from uh, Mr. Andrew Cesar Rimando. May we know the disaster risk reduction in your LGU or how much reduction in disaster risk has been attained after the implementation of your DRRM programs? Uh, Malaki po. Sige oh, po, sir. Go ahead po. po yung MD, uh, DRRM programs namin uh, from bottom up sa barangay level pa lang ano, yung DRRM programs nila uh, malaking tulong sa barangay. Uh, kasi dito sa Abuyog uh, I have 63 barangays uh, and they are all unique. Uh, may mga barangay ako na nasa gilid ng dagat. May barangay ako na sa uh, mountainous na area. Uh, malaki kasi yung area ko so so yung DRRM preparedness malaking factor talaga yon um, yung preparedness malaking factor yung ano uh, sa reduction ng uh, ng disaster risk thank you very much vice mayor uh, Traya now let's jump to DRRM funding and uh, we have a question for our uh, PIDS presenters and perhaps we can hear from uh, RV okay mm -hmm. Uh, from Robert Padillo, uh, do you think that the current provision for funding in the RRM is not yet enough? If so, do you recommend a policy intervention to expand a uh, fiscal leeway for the RRM? Uh, RV. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Um, I think for um, in terms of funding, as we can see in the findings, there are sub optimal um, utilization pa of funding. So there is much more to um, to optimizing and exploiting the the DRRM fund for mm -hmm. um, for related activities and initiatives among LGUs. And as mentioned by our other um, presenters and panelists, 
it is really a matter of um, coordinating and as well as significant um, capacity building among the LGUs um, I, um, so that they can better identify yung mga um, projects and programs that they can do. And by um, capacitating them, it becomes clear to them how they can um, utilize the money based on the mm -hmm. guidelines prescribed by uh, DBM, by DILG, and COA. So coordinating between, among those agencies to uh, clarify the guidelines and capacitating the um, our local DRRM officers to better identify the necessary projects in their um, respective localities. And, uh, Thank you, RV. Okay, so let us now uh, go to another question from um, Mr. Uh, Cesar Riman, Andrew Cesar Rimando. Okay, in 2014, our CSO participated in boot camp as part of the BUB, bottom-up budgeting um, approach of the government. And I think this was implemented, implemented by the DBM. Do you suggest that this type of budgeting uh, be done and implemented again by the present uh, administration. May we hear from our uh, speakers, uh, uh, from our uh, uh, discussants. Uh, Ma'am Pam, Miss Pam, would you like to answer this question? Do you think it's worth uh, reviving the BUB? Uh, I think it has its advantages, Sheila. That mm -hmm. uh, we'll have the bottom up, uh, bottom up budget budgeting. But again, uh, the, the the expert on this will always be the DBM mm -hmm. uh, for us to really review that mm -hmm. the strategy of our mm -hmm. budgeting process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Miss Pam. Uh, Doctor Domingo Sani, uh, would you have anything to say regarding this question? DUB. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I think it's it's a welcome platform in terms of us strengthening participation uh, from the communities. No? We just have to insulate the process from political uh, influence. Mm -hmm. so I guess we just have uh, to make sure that the process is uh, as clean as possible, as, trans as transparent as possible, uh, capturing the sentiments and inputs from our uh, community stakeholders. So, mm -hmm. so I am in agreement uh, as long as DBM is also in agreement and DOF is also in agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sonny Domingo. Now let's go to a question from Texon John Lim uh, and perhaps uh, our uh, representative from o OCD, uh, Mr. Ben Salvador, can answer this. Were the RRM investments mainstream in NGA through the years considered? Uh, for example, the DPL, uh, DPWH flood control programs and evacuation centers, the OST's early warning systems, and OEC, OCD's and IT infra for DRR. Um, Mr. Ben? Uh, well, thank you very much. Actually, uh, the, the person who asked the question is also from OCD, okay. our director. But uh, nevertheless, um, on the part of the DRRM Fund Management Division, we're also looking, apart from the DRRM Fund, we're now looking into the budget of the different agencies. And we have uh, noted that uh, for the flood management program, actually, of uh, the DPWH, there has been an allocation of more or less $128 billion, if I if I recall it right. Likewise, for evacuation centers, they also have provided these, uh, these are being programmed across the year. So, um, during the conduct of my study, I also looked into the savings or the unutilized budget of the DPWH. Across the five years uh, of the conduct of the study, we found out that more or less 35 billion is being unutilized as a budget of our DPWH. And that is almost or more than double of the NDRM fund. So perhaps uh, we should also, the problem here with us now on the, on the part of the DRRM fund is there's no mechanism yet as to the tagging of the budget during the budgeting or during the net, unlike the, unlike the climate uh, change expenditure um, tagging, which mm -hmm. is very uh, defined. 
And perhaps you can also ask uh, the DOF on this, since I'm really interested in this uh, question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Ms. Pam, uh, would you like to uh, provide your inputs to this? I, I think the question from uh, Sir Texan refers to the infrastructure. Am I correct? Um, the question is, uh, were DRR, DRR investments mainstream in NGA through the years considered, for example, DPWH, flood control programs and evacuation centers, DOSTs, early warning systems, or o and o OCD's IT infra for DRR? Uh -huh. We will have to study this, Sheila. It's okay uh, now. On this requirement and in the suggestion. Mm -hmm. But I think to mention again, uh, Sheila, another uh, 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 related to the topic of uh, also of uh, disaster uh, funding is that we are also pushing for almost two Congresses now um, mm -hmm. coverage, mandated insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. Uh, of uh, of the LGUs because right now the mandatory coverage of for insurance of, for insuring all PPAs of the local government mm -hmm. units are only for cities and provinces and first class municipalities. So the coverage, well, we're going into that infra and other uh, mm -hmm. requirement is that uh, the other LGU second class municipalities and below uh, are not mandated to insure oh yeah mm -hmm. so what will happen diba, every time that there's a calamity mm -hmm. so that one thing that we're really pushing for from the bureau of local government finance you know? mm -hmm. thank you very much for that um uh important information miss pam okay let's can go I, to can yes I answer, Sheila? yes yes Just sunny very go related ahead. Uh, with regard to the question of uh, from OCD, I think a weakness that we have right now is that we don't have that comprehensive consolidated uh, DRRM asset inventory. Mm -hmm. So although we have been funding year after year, um, even capital outlays on DRRM related uh, assets no, or investments, we don't have that uh, eventual consolidated inventory that we can really look at right now at present. That's right. Uh, showing mm -hmm. us other areas for augmentation investment wise so that is something mm -hmm. that we can probably invest on generating that inventory in the near future it's not really that difficult uh, mm -hmm. once we have mm -hmm. the compliance and cooperation of, of all uh, institutions in government so you have the bureaucracy acting on this and probably you'll have uh, a generated uh, inventory in two in two or mm -hmm. three months uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. uh, probably that relates to that question about us funding all those uh, capital outlays over the years and not uh, probably being recorded mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. public view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sunny. Okay, we have a question from Abner Lapas. Can anyone tell more about the funding of the Barangay DRR plan? How do the municipal or city or provincial level support those plans in terms of providing resources to implement barangay plans? Well, this question actually was covered in the M Trias uh, presentation. Well, of course, in the context of this LGU. Um, and uh, the M Trias, would you like to uh, give your quick response to this question by referencing your earlier presentation on the fund utilization um, and 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 the, and on the fund utilization by barangays using their DRRM plan, sir? Uh, ano, ano ulit yung question, ma'am? Opo. Um, ang question po is from Mr. Abner Malapas. Can anyone tell more about the funding of the barangay DRR plan? Which you covered kanina sa presentation nyo. And how do the municipal, uh, city, or provincial level support those plans in terms of providing resources to implement barangay? Uh, una, uh, before they can make their budgeting yung barangay, uh, nag-ano muna kami ng CBDRRM training, then after that they can proceed to making their budget kung ano yung plano nila. Yun na nga, bottoms up, kung ano yung need ng barangay, sila yung um, uh, nag-implement. Then after that, kung nag may pagkukulang uh, yung 
uh, for example, pondo ng barangay, uh, that's where the LGO come in. Tumutulong kami sa kanila. If in case, yon yung situation, kulang yung uh, funding nila. Kasi alam naman natin, uh, yung pondo ng barangay is hindi, hindi ganun kalaki. Unlike sa uh, LGO nga uh, uh, manageable. So tumutulong tayo sa barangay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Chaya. Uh, another question on the RRM and the RRM. Uh, um, well, this this one is about metrics, no? From Andrew Cesar Raimondo. May we know if there are figures on key success indicators uh, of DRM projects like lesser flooding for mil millimeter rain for area for unit time, lesser families affected during rainy season, lesser damage in agriculture. May we hear from our uh, representative from the OCD, uh, is there, uh, has there been an effort to uh, develop metrics so we can uh, uh, accurately and uh, fully um, evaluate the success of our DRRM projects? Sir? Well, hello. Uh as of now, I think there has been no metrics of that kind. However, um, as a tool, we now use the uh, Gawad Kalasag, but it's more of an institutional um, assessment and uh, more on the capacity. And um, I think um, our uh, national government agencies should also join us in this campaign to develop such kind of uh, local success indicators. But as far as uh, the local DRM planning is concerned, it's more of a results-based but this would also um, greatly contribute if we should have this kind of uh, metrics. At the same time, we should develop standards. But for instance, what should be the earthquake-proof structures? What should be the disaster-proof uh, uh, structures that we can have or infrastructures that we can have? So that would be, uh, would be for future or ways forward for the national government on their part on uh, developing national standards. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Salvador. Uh, another question from Virginia Batan. Aside from government expenditure on the RRM, is there a report capturing the expenditure of the private organizations and households for disaster risk reduction? Um, Sunny, based on your research, uh, did you see any uh, such kind of uh, report uh, that is uh, available? Yeah, there is no report right now available in literature looking at uh, private sector spending on the RRM. So we focused on uh, public expenditure, public investment, yes. because mm -hmm. that's the more accessible uh, set of mm -hmm. evidences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's also another entry point for intervention from, from us. We can do uh, research on uh, private sector or household uh, expenditures, expenditures are related. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Domingo. Okay, we have to uh, um, fast track our uh, Q&A because we have no more time, but we still have uh, several uh, questions left and answered. And uh, with the indulgence of our speakers, uh, we have to uh, extend our Q&A uh, uh, I bet, okay, we have a question from Ronald Andrew Noprada. How can we encourage LGU, especially the cabinet cluster on CCAM, the RR, LGUs, to increase the, RR, the RRM fund utilization? I think there, have been, there has been uh, a number of uh, recommendations given by our uh, um, speakers, no? both our presenters and, uh, and our discussants. So, um, may, may I ask, um, may I throw this question to our OCD representative, uh, Sir Ben? Uh, in a nutshell, what can you recommend to, um, on how to encourage our LGUs to increase the RRM fund utilization? Well, um, this is not only for the CCAM DRR LGUs, but this applies to all LGUs based on the uh, findings of uh, Dr. Domingo. Uh, primarily, the very first thing that we should develop is a sound local DRRM plan. When I say sound, that should be risk-informed. That would uh, reflect actually the risk in the area. And uh, for LGUs, they can have this inter-LGU cooperation when it comes to budget. Although based on the findings, a lot of LGUs are saying that they don't have budget, but when it comes to utilization, that's a problem. 
So you have um, mentioned a while ago, when it comes to um, involvement as well of the community, you should also um, reach out to them because the projects that we're going to implement, they should be the beneficiaries. And if we consulted them, they would have ownership. And once we implement these projects, they will participate. That's mm -hmm. one of the, um, not really a sure part, but that would encourage the LGUs to participate more or to use their spending. Because it's a matter of programming. If you don't program it in your local DRRM plan, you may have a challenge in utilizing your fund. Mm -hmm. So that, that should go side by side. And of course, the, of course, the soundness of the plan should also be given emphasis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Salvador. Okay, we have a, a question from Benigno Balgos. Are LGUs able to access the NDRRM fund? And what is the their utilization rate? What is the utilization rate of the LGUs access in the NDRRM fund? Uh, Mr. Ben, can they access the NDRRM fund? Yes. Our um, LGUs? For, yeah, for section uh, 22 of the Republic. Uh, 1121, the NGAs and the LGUs would have the access to, uh, to the uh, NDRRM fund. By the way, uh, good afternoon to uh, Sir Ninoy Balcos. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to utilization, from 2016 to 2021, we look into the data, there are only about 34 LGUs who actually uh, managed to access the NDRRM fund. And uh, that's only 4.9 billion out of 133.716 billion that is appropriated for the NDRRM fund for the last six years, meaning to say that's more or less 3.67%. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that LGUs are not accessing the fund because the mechanisms currently that we have right now doesn't allow them to actually implement, directly implement. In order for them to implement, they have to be certified by the Department of uh, Public Works and Highways, for instance, when it comes to uh, infrastructure, if not, uh, the project would only be lodged to the DEOs, uh, district engineering office or regional offices for that instance. And another thing I would like to highlight, this is one of the good practice of the DBM when it comes to risk financing. Uh, when uh, typhoons, Kinta, Super Typhoon Rolly and Ulysses happened uh, way back in uh, 2020, based on the report of the National DRMC and the DROMIC of the DSWD, the DBM released uh, in two tranches, 3 billion for certain LGUs, for those affected LGUs, meaning this is a direct financial assistance to those LGUs. Then uh, what that happens last year, um, because of the president's priority, or that LGUs, or that affected LGUs actually uh, took 6.8 billion of the funding coming from an appropriated um, appropriation and the contingent budget. So, there has been a shift in uh, when it comes to the utilization and of budget, and you also notice that lot of L lots of LGUs. In, I mean, there's an increasing number of LGUs for actually um, tapping the entering fund mm -hmm. until COVID nineteen came last year and for twenty twenty one. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Salvador. Okay, we have uh, another question here about uh, the bottom up approach and how effective it is. Um, how well it is implemented uh, at the local level. And uh, Dr. Domingo has uh, reported on this uh, during their presentation. And Fiona Norada said that this, does this mean because of the reported wide gap between allocation and utilization? Is it, is it safe to say that the bottom-up approach to planning for proper programming and contingency, contingency development was not properly implemented despite the many policies and government or structural support besides the transparency measures how else can we how else can the executive support a bottom up approach to ldrrm planning um dr domingo sani would you like to answer this yes sheila probably that's one of the answers uh, in terms of us answering the question about how to increase the utilization rates uh, among lgus so, our LGUs being in touch more with the constituents, with the stakeholders, with the communities, would probably give them more uh, ammo in terms of them populating their, their investment programs. You know. As also mentioned by OCD earlier, uh, planning, investment programming really are, are the keys you know, in terms of them properly managing and using available resources within the LGU. So yeah, I think just 
augmenting, strengthening that linkage between the LGU and the constituents or the stakeholders probably would uh, redound to better usage of funds, you know? not only for the RM, but probably for all other uh, development initiatives. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Domingo. We have two questions again on capacity uh, development in response to uh, disasters. One is from jo Joshua Magsumbol. It's about uh, capacitating our uh, uh, our barangays in their response to natural disasters. Uh, has there been a study that addresses their strengths and opportunities for improvement? Uh, uh, Sunny, have you come across any study on this uh, capacity development at the barangays and a study that uh, looks into their strengths and opportunities for improvement? Yeah, yeah, there have been so many initiatives led by both the ILG and uh, international funding agencies, including UNDP, trying to augment the capacities of uh, barangay officials in terms of them coming up with CB dreams, no? uh, community-based plans. And it's really the weakness of the bureaucracy uh, in terms of us capturing inputs from the barangay. So we have tens of thousands of barangays and supposedly they are uh, those who are in the front line when it comes to uh, disaster response and being resilient uh, at the most no? bureaucratic ones. But uh, we have been seeing evidences that they are also the most neglected, not only in terms of the planning process, but also in terms of uh, funding and, and giving uh, resources and capacity to their actors. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is something that, uh, that's worth uh, taking note of. We need not only to uh, strengthen uh, our barangay constituents you know, for them to be able to to go into the municipal and city processes and input the concerns of their uh, constituents uh, in the eventual uh, crafted documents. No? May they be planning documents or investment programming documents. So that is something uh, that we need to have more interventions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dovingo. Well, uh, Aileen, uh, Marisa Hermosa has also a related question, but uh, I'll skip uh, her question because this has been answered already. Okay, um, huh? we, we are down to our last two questions and this time uh, from Julius Dumangas uh, on meeting key DRM outcomes. Uh, for the panelists, how relevant, coherent, efficient, effective, and impactful are existing bottom-up approaches to the RRM in meeting key DRM outcomes? Well, we has, this has been partly answered by uh, Dr. Domingo. Um, may I hear um, this time from uh, our representative from the OCD, uh, Mr. Ben Salvador? Hello. Yes, Mr. Salvador, would you like me to uh, repeat the question? Uh, no, okay. Only, only okay. That. Well, there might be um, lots of uh, stories of success when it comes to the participation of the civil society organizations in planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Unfortunately, if we are going to uh, quantify it and look it into the macro perspective, we could say that it's not yet efficient. Although there's a mechanism for the government to involve them, however, their participation as of now has been limited. Well, why is that so? Because uh, one of the in issues that affect this is number one, the institutionalization of LDMOs. I actually am actually scrolling upon the um, the Gawad Kalasag assessment results on how many LGUs have um, permanent LDM officers, meaning to say the head of agencies and the head of the LGUs. But I see a lot of LGUs actually which doesn't have that one. And the other one, when it, as I mentioned a while ago, when it comes to planning, unless this is participatory and the process to involve the lower LGUs, the vulnerable sector, the CSOs, has become mandatory. Only this time when we can see actual and good results on this, um, on this concern. Thank you, mm -hmm. but for now. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ben Salvador of the OCD. And then we have our final um, question this time is from one of our Facebook viewers, Christina Makaraig. How can startups or small 
uh, private companies building solutions for disaster risk response and mitigation for the LGUs get support, advice, and endorsement from the OCD and DRRM. Um, Mr. Salvador, this question is again for you. Okay. When it comes to uh, the participation of the the private sector, they're they're always encouraged. Although uh, at the NDRMC, um, we already have a permanent. It's not actually permanent members, but we have members who belong to the private sector, the academic faith based organization, and um, the civil society organizations. Well, if they have uh, these um, sustainable solutions for the NDRMC then um, they can invite us to present to us their uh, these innovations. We're still open with that. And I've witnessed for how many times that there has been um, companies who have been um, seeking um, audience from our um, administrator and even from other agencies to present this kind of initiative. So this is a welcome development. But likewise, I, uh, we can also uh, encourage you to directly go to the LGUs and um, you can also ask them to, um, to have the to have these uh, things explored on their own qualities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Uh, ben Salvador of the OCD. Well, uh, this um, uh, concludes our open uh, forum and to cap our discussion, may I ask our speakers from some brief parting words, if they have any. Let's start with Dr. Domingo, his parting words uh, for him and uh, on behalf of Ms. Manihar. Uh, Dr. Domingo, please go ahead. Yes, Sheila. Well, first off, thank you to you and your team for, for hosting this uh, platform for us to present our, our study. And then we also have only thanks uh, for our panel reactors no? from OCD, from BLGF, from Abuyog LGU. Um, OCD, as uh, we have heard their manifestations, I think is in a very progressive uh, ladder you know, when it comes to uh, them serving as the Secretariat of NVMC and also them safeguarding the grounding of policy down the line. The LGF, I think it's way back in 2018 when we had a key informant interview with uh, Director Pam. And back then, really, we were trying to ask them to generate the uh, local DRM fund uh, coming from our sub-national reports. And it wasn't present back then. And right now, I think it's only worth augmenting what they have now and coming up with probably a better standardized uh, format of reporting. We can capitalize on the platform of uh, the ILG, uh, uh, Open Disclosure Portal, and probably have a more detailed reporting coming from our LGUs. Our LGUs, I think right now, uh, are still not reporting annually their DRRM status. And that is a very big weakness uh, mm -hmm. in the scheme of things. We need to get uh, inputs uh, from the, from the sub-national actors and constituents. And that can only be spearheaded by our LGUs. And that's why we have the Abuyog representative here. Right. And just as we have our interviews with BLGF in 2018, we also had, we also had our interviews with Abuyog. And we've been there several times, and we are witness uh, in terms of how progressive Abuyog is. But uh, it is also probably a cautionary tale because no matter how progressive and prepared Abuyog is or was, uh, still way back uh, in April you know, this year, they still uh, encountered so much challenges you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when faced with uh, natural disaster. So, yeah, it's, it's probably us uh, being guided by the principle of continuously improving, right, that's both right. at the national and sub-national levels. Mm -hmm. The same goes with us improving on policy and policy ground. So with that, I thank you again and have a pleasant remaining day. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sonny Dubingo and Mr. Ms. Arbitron Manihar. Now may we hear from uh, Mr. Ben Salvador of the uh, Office of Civil Defense. Go ahead, Mr. Salvador. Thank you very much. Well, at first glance, we, and we always think that the RRM is always uh, a government concern only. But just like the Sendai framework encourages uh, the government, the state 
to be the main actors, it, we should also share the responsibility towards our stakeholders. So this is where community participation and bottom-up approach comes in. And uh, we should also capitalize on our uh, systems that we have now, which um, includes the whole of government and whole of society approach, ensuring that uh, there is a social justice in the RRM, meaning to say those who have less in life must have more in disaster risk financing. So on behalf of our administrator, Yusek Ricardo Bihalad, uh, we'd like to thank you for inviting the Office of Civil Defense in this endeavor. And uh, to all those who, participant, uh, who participated in this activity, thank you very much and magandang hapon po sa lahat. Paraming salamat din po, Mr. Ben Salvador of the Office of Civil Defense. Um, I, I heard um, Mr. Salvador mentioning social justice, which you will hear more. Uh, in September, uh, during the, our celebration of the Development Policy Research Month. Right, Sunny? <laughs> okay. Okay, now let us listen to, to Dr. Uh, Pam Kizon, the Deputy Executive Director of the uh, BLGF. Ms. Pam, please proceed. Hi, Sheila. And yes, very much through Dr. Sunny. Way back in 2018, when we started talking about data, you were one of our stakeholders together with OCD at the time na telling us, why not piggyback um, an LDRIM fund data capture in our SRE system? We started that in 2020, Dr. Sunny and Sheila and OCD, uh, Sir Ben. And now we have 2018, 2019, 2020, up to 2021 and 2022 data. But unfortunately, we're very insecure because no one's checking our data. We hope that for accuracy, because we don't have any more problem in uh, submission, eh, we already have 99.99% timely submission of the local treasures. What we hope out of this webinar, we can again sit down, look at our data that we have gathered and see where we can check and do a vetting of this uh, data set. Why are we doing this? Because we know that coming up with sound policy starts with gathering historical data. And I know that PIBS knows that much more than we do. So good afternoon. Thank you for having the Bureau of Local Government Finance as one of your discussants. And thank you very much, Ms. Pam. Okay. And of course, uh, last but definitely not the least, may we hear from Vice Mayor Triop, the Municipality of Abuyon. Sir? Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, gusto ko magpasalamat sa Philippine Institute of Devel for Development Studies for inviting me. Also, uh, tama yung sinabi kanina ni Mr. Sunny Domingo. Uh, yung abo yung prepared, uh, kahit anong preparedness na gagawin natin uh, yung nangyari dito sa abo yung uh, na landslide sa Barangay Pilar, we still face uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, that's why um, uh, I'll be coordinating with OCD, Office of Civil Defense for uh, para sa any seminars or trainings regarding contingency planning on landslides. So again, uh, thank you very much sa inyong lahat. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yun lang po. Maraming salamat din po, Vice Mayor Shraya. Friends, please join me in thanking all our speakers for the nuggets of wisdom that they have shared with us this afternoon. And also thank you to those who join in the discussion by sending uh, their comments and questions. Let's show our appreciation through a big virtual clap. Okay, and here are the winners of our webinar raffle from Zoom, Juvi Leonardo uh, Gopela and Raymark uh, Tablanza and from Facebook, Christina Makaraig. Uh, to all our winners, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your, of your prize. And finally, friends, we have some reminders. Okay, so you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar on the PIDS website. Um, flash on the screen is, uh, uh, is, the, uh, web, is the URL of our events page, and we will post after the webinar the presentations uh, of our uh, presenters from PIDS as well as the uh, 
comments, the presentations of our discussions. Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. And please regularly visit our website and follow us on our Facebook and Twitter account. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of our um, virtual events. Okay, and flash on the screen is our webinar on August 11 on the theme Capacitating and Investing in the Youth for a Productive and Resilient Future. This virtual forum is being organized by the Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Project of PIDS and will feature the knowledge products of some SERPI partner institutions such as the CMEO Inutech, CERCA, and uh, the DLSU, Jesse M. Robredo Institute of Governance. There will also be a presentation from PIDS. This forum is our humble contribution to the observance of the International Youth Day on August 12. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. Their names, the names of those offices and institutions are flashed on the screen. And this concludes our virtual policy forum for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and see you in our next virtual event. Maraming salamat po.